The Forgiveness of Sin, a practical exposition of Psalm 130 by Dr. John Owen, who lived from 1616 to 1683. Prefatory Notice, Sketch of the Author's Life. The following treatise, which by many spiritual Christians has been considered the best of Dr. Owen's works, is here divided into chapters, with heads indicating the subject of each, and showing at a glance in the table of contents the author's train of thought. Numerous repetitions in announcing his subdivisions are also omitted, and obsolete terms and phrases in many cases exchanged for others. It is recorded in reference to the origin of this work, that the young man who afterwards became a minister of Christ, being under religious impressions, came to Dr. Owen for counsel. In the course of the conversation, the doctor asked, Pray, in what manner do you think to go to God? Well, through the mediator, sir, said the young man, to which Dr. Owen replied, As that is easily said, but it is another thing to go to God through the mediator than what many who use the expression are aware of. I myself preached some years when I had but very little, if any, experimental acquaintance with access to God through Christ, until the Lord was pleased to visit me with sore affliction, by which I was brought to the mouth of the grave, and under which my soul was oppressed with horror and darkness. But God graciously relieved my spirit by a powerful application of Psalm 130, verse 4. There is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. From whence I received special instruction, peace, and comfort, and drawing near to God through the Mediator, and I preached thereupon immediately after my recovery. None who seriously and prayerfully read this treatise will fail to discover the grounds and the appropriateness of the above appeal to an inquiring youth the rich sources from which the author has drawn divine instruction in its adaptation to the wants of every perishing soul. The great John Owen was born at Statham, Oxfordshire, England, in the year 1616, and died at Ealing, August 24, 1683, aged 67. He was contemporary with John Bunyan, Richard Baxter, and John Flavel, and shared in the bitter opposition they encountered for their nonconformity. His father being a clergyman, he received an early education, and at twelve was admitted a student at Queen's College, Oxford, where he graduated with honor and continued the pursuit of study till the age of twenty-one, when new laws and regulations were imposed on the university by Archbishop Laud, to which he could not conscientiously submit. He commenced his labors in the ministry at Fordham, whence they were transferred to Coggeshall, and early began to write in defense of the truth. In 1643, he published his treatise, The Duty of Pastors and People Distinguished, showing that the personal obligations of every believer to aid in spreading the truth as it is in Jesus, and soon after a treatise founded on two short catechisms for the benefit of the young. In 1646, being summoned to preach before Parliament, he boldly proclaimed the doctrines of the cross, and on numerous future occasions fulfilled the same duty with equal fidelity to God and the souls of men. One of these sermons introduced him to Oliver Cromwell, who appointed him his chaplain, and in 1651 he was elected by Parliament to the deanery of Christ Church, Oxford, and soon after was appointed by Cromwell, vice-chancellor of that university. He continued his connection with Oxford for nine years until the death of Cromwell, when he was displaced. During this period, the change in the circumstances, literature, and piety of the university were truly astonishing. His labors were great almost beyond parallel, and as successful as arduous. He also, while at Oxford, often preached before Parliament, and wrote many valuable works, including his treatises on divine justice, on the Sassanian controversy, the mortification of sin in believers, on communion with God, and on temptation. In 1663, he was invited to settle as pastor of a church in Boston, the request being seconded by a respectful letter from the General Court of Massachusetts, and he was afterwards elected president of Harvard College, but he declined these invitations, and for several years ministered to a church in London. From the time of his leaving Oxford to 1776, he published no less than 22 different works, among which were his treatises on Psalm 130, on indwelling sin, on the Trinity, on the Sabbath, the Holy Spirit, and on apostasy. 
At length, his health declined, and he retired to Kensington, and from thence to Ealing, where he closed his days in writing his meditations on the glory of Christ. On the morning of the day he died, a friend called to tell him the work was put to press. I am glad to hear it, said the dying Christian, and lifted up his hands and eyes as if transported with joy. He exclaimed, But, oh, the long wish for day is come at last, in which I shall see that glory in another manner than I have ever done, or was capable of doing in this world. His published works comprise twenty-eight large octavo volumes, the largest work being the commentary on the epistle to the Hebrews, which occupied his attention for sixteen years. The Forgiveness of Sin, illustrated in Psalm 130. Paraphrase of the Psalm and Plan of the Work Verse 1 Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. Verse 2 Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. O Lord, through my manifold sins and provocations I have brought myself into great distresses. My iniquities are always before me, and I am ready to be overwhelmed with them as with a flood of waters. For they have brought me into depths wherein I am ready to be swallowed up. But although my distress be great and perplexing, I do not, I dare not utterly despond and cast away all hopes of relief. Nor do I seek unto any other remedy or means of relief, but I apply myself to thee, Jehovah, to thee alone." And in this my application unto thee, the greatness and urgency of my troubles, make my soul urgent, earnest, and pressing in my supplications. Whilst I have no rest, I can give thee no rest. O oh, therefore, attend and hearken unto the voice of my crying and supplications. Verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? It is true, O Lord, Thou God, great and terrible, that if thou shouldest deal with me in this condition, with any man living, with the best of thy saints, according to the strict and exact tenor of thy law, which first represents itself to my guilty conscience and troubled soul, there would be neither for me nor them the least expectation of deliverance. All flesh must fail before thee, and the spirits which thou hast made, and that to eternity, for who could stand before thee when thou shouldest so execute thy displeasure? Verse 4. But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. But, O Lord, this is not absolutely and universally the state of things between thy majesty and poor sinners. Thou art in thy nature infinitely good and gracious, ready and free in the purposes of thy will to receive them. And there is such a blessed way made for the exercise of the holy inclinations and purposes of thy heart towards them, in the mediation and blood of thy dear Son, that they have assured foundations of concluding and believing that there is pardon and forgiveness with thee in the way of thine appointment. This way, therefore, will I, with all that fear thee, persist in, I will not give over, leave thee, or turn from thee, through my fears, discouragements, and despondencies, but will abide constantly in the observance of the worship which thou hast prescribed, and render the obedience which thou dost require, having great encouragement so to do. Number five, I wait for the Lord, my soul doth wait, and in his word do I hope. And herein, on account of the forgiveness that is with thee, O Lord, do I wait with all patience, quietness, and perseverance, in this work is my whole soul engaged, even in an earnest expectation of thy approach unto me in a way of grace and mercy. And for my encouragement therein hast thou given me a blessed word of grace, a faithful word of promise wherein my hope is fixed. Psalm 130, verse 6. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Yea, in the discharge of this duty, my soul is intent upon thee, and in its whole frame turned towards thee, and that with such diligence and watchfulness and looking out after every way and manner of thy appearance, of thy manifestation of thyself in coming unto me, that I excel therein those who with longing desire and earnest expectation wait and watch for the appearance of the morning and that either that they may rest from their night watches, or have light for the duties of thy worship in the temple in which they most delight. 
Number seven, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Verse eight, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Herein have I found such rest, peace, and satisfaction to my own soul, that I cannot but invite and encourage others to take the same course with me. Let then all the Israel of God, all that fear him, learn this of me and from my experience. Be not hasty in your distresses. Despond not, despair not. Turn not aside to other remedies, but hope in the Lord. For I can now, and in a special manner, give testimony to this, that there is mercy with him suited to your relief. Yea, whatever your distress be, the redemption that is with him is so bounteous, plenteous, and unsearchable, that the undoubted issue of your performance of this duty will be that you shall be delivered from the guilt of all your sins and the perplexities of all your troubles. My design in the ensuing treatise is to illustrate the teaching of the Holy Ghost in the psalm as expressing in the experience of the psalmist and the working of his faith the state of a soul in itself greatly perplexed, relieved through divine grace and acting towards God and is sank suitably to the displays of that grace, a great design and full of great instruction. To be more particularly, we have the state of the distressed soul, out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. His application to God alone for relief. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. His deprecation of God's justice. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? The relief found in God's mercy. But there is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. The acting of his faith towards God. I wait for the Lord. My soul doth wait. And in his word do I trust. My soul waiteth for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. And the acting of his faith towards the saints. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption, and he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The Lord in mercy so dispose of these meditations, that both he that writes and they that read may be made partakers of the benefit, relief, and consolation intended for his saints in the psalm by the Holy Ghost. Chapter 1 The Soul in the Depths of Sin The state of the soul here represented is a basis on which this psalm is built and which first claims our consideration is described in the expression out of the depths. Some of the ancients, as Chrysostom, suppose this expression to relate to the depths of the heart of the psalmist. But the obvious sense of the place and the constant use of the word in the Hebrew will not admit of this interpretation. It is in the plural number, depths. It is commonly used for valleys or in deep places, whatever, but especially of waters. Valleys and deep places, because of their darkness and solitariness, are accounted places of horror, helplessness, and trouble. Psalm 23, 4 When I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that is, in the extremity of danger and trouble, the moral use of the word as expressing the state and condition of the souls of men is metaphorical. These depths, then, are difficulties or pressures attended with fear, horror, danger, and trouble, and they are of two sorts, providential, in respect to outward distresses, calamities, and afflictions. Save me, O God, for the waters are come in unto my soul. Psalm 69, 1. In the Hebrew, I stick in the mire of the deep, and there is no standing. I am come into the depths of waters, and the floods overflow me. It is trouble in the extremity of it that the psalmist thus expresses. He was brought by it into a condition like a man ready to be drowned, being cast into the bottom of deep and miry waters, where he had no firm foundation to stand upon nor ability to come out as he further explains himself, verse 15. There are also internal depths, depths of conscience on account of sin. Thou hast laid me in the lowest pit, in darkness, 
in the deeps. Psalm 88, 6. What he intends by this expression, the psalmist declares in the next words, verse 7, Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Sense of God's wrath upon his conscience on account of sin was the deep he was cast into. So verse 15, speaking of the same matter, he saith, I suffer thy terrors. And verse 16, thy fierce wrath goeth over me which he calls waters, waves, and deeps, according to the metaphor already explained. And these are the deeps that are here principally intended. Augustine says on this place, he cries out under the weight and waves of his sins. This the ensuing psalm makes evident. Desiring to be delivered from these depths out of which he cried, he deals with God wholly about mercy and forgiveness, and it is sin alone from which forgiveness is a deliverance. The doctrine also that he preaches upon his delivery is that of mercy, grace, and redemption, as is manifest from the close of the psalm. And what we have deliverance by is most upon our hearts when we are delivered. It is true, indeed, that these deeps do often concur as David speaks. Deep calleth unto deep. Psalm 42, 7. The deeps of affliction awaken the conscience to a deep sense of sin. But sin is the disease, affliction only a symptom of it. And in effecting a cure, the disease itself is principally to be heeded. The symptom will follow or depart of itself. This in general is the state of the soul as described in this psalm, and is as a key to the ensuing discourse or the hinge on which it turns. Hence we deduce these two propositions. Gracious souls, after much communion with God, may be brought into inextricable depths and entanglements on account of sin. The inward root of distresses is principally to be attended to in all pressing trials. Our sin is the cause of our afflictions. It is a sad truth that we have proposed for consideration. He that hears it ought to tremble in himself, that he may rest in the day of trouble. It speaks out the Apostle's advice, Be not high-minded, but fear. Romans 11.20 And let him that thinketh he standeth, take heed lest he fall. 1 Corinthians 10.12 When Peter had learned his truth by woeful experience, after all his boldness and forwardness, he gives this counsel to all saints, that they would pass the time of their soul journeying here in fear. 1 Peter 1.17 knowing how near in our greatest peace and serenity evil and danger may lie even at the door. Some few instances of the many that are left on record wherein this truth is exemplified may be mentioned. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God, Genesis 6-9. He did so a long season, and that in an evil time amidst all sorts of temptations, when all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. This gave an eminency to his obedience, and doubtless rendered the communion which he had with God in walking before him most sweet and precious to him. He was a gracious soul, upon the undoubted testimony of God himself. But we know what befell this holy person. He that shall read the story recorded of Noah, Genesis 9.20, will easily grant that he was brought into inextricable distress on account of his sin. His own drunkenness, verse 21, with the consequences of it, provoked the unnatural conduct of his son, verse 22. And this leads him to the devoting of that son and his posterity to destruction, verse 24 and 25, all which joined with the sense of God's just indignation, from whom he had newly received that tremendously miraculous deliverance, must overwhelm him with sorrow and anxiety of spirit. The matter is more clear in David. Under the Old Testament, none loved God more than he, and none was loved of God more than he. The paths of faith and love wherein he walked are, to the most of us, like the way of an eagle in the air, too high and hard for us. Yet to this very day that the cries of this man after God's own heart sound in our ears. Sometimes he complains of broken bones, sometimes of drowning deeps, sometimes of waves and water spouts. Sometimes of wounds and diseases, sometimes of wrath and the sorrows of hell. Everywhere of his sins, the burden and trouble of them, 
some of the occasions of his depths, darkness, entanglements, and distresses we all know. As no man had more grace than he, so none is a greater instance of the power of sin and the effects of its guilt upon the conscience. But instances of this kind are obvious and occur to the thoughts of all, so that they need not be repeated. I shall show, then, what is intended by the depths into which gracious souls, after much communion with God, may fall. Whence it comes to pass that they may so fall, and what sins usually bring them into great spiritual distresses with some aggravations of those sins. Number one, what are some of the depths into which believers may fall? First, loss of the sense of the love of God which the soul formerly enjoyed. There is a twofold sense of the love of God of which believers in this world may be made partakers. There is the transient acting of the heart by the Holy Ghost with ravishing joys and apprehension of God's love and our relation to Him in Christ. This, or the immediate effect of it, is called joy unspeakable and full of glory, 1 Peter 1.8. The Holy Ghost, shining into the heart, with a clear evidence of the soul's interest in all gospel mercies, causes it to leap for joy, to exult and triumph in the Lord, as being for a season carried above all sense and thought of sin, self, temptation, or trouble. But as God gives the bread of his house unto all his children, so these dainties and high cordials he reserves only for the seasons and persons wherein and to whom he knows them to be needful and useful. Believers may be without this sense of love, and yet be in no depths. Again, there is an abiding sense of God's love upon the hearts of those of whom we speak, who have long had communion with God, consisting in a prevailing gospel persuasion that they are accepted with God in Christ. Being justified by faith, we have peace with God, Romans 5.1. This is the root from whence spring all that peace and ordinary consolation of which believers in this world are made partakers. This is that which quickens and enlivens them to duty. Psalm 116, 12 and 13 And is a salt that renders their sacrifices and performances savory to God and refreshing to themselves. This supports them under their trials, gives them peace, hope and comfort in life and death. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Psalm 23, 4 A sense of God's presence and love is sufficient to rebuke all anxiety and fears, and not only so, but to give in the midst of them solid consolation and joy. So the prophet expresses it. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vine, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will joy in the God of my salvation. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18 And this is that sense of love which the choicest believers may lose on account of sin. This is one step into their depths. They do not retain such gospel apprehension of it as to give them rest, peace, or consolation to influence their souls with delight in duty or to support in trials. Number two, perplexed thoughtfulness about their great unkindness towards God is another part of the depths of sin and tingled souls. So David complains, I remembered God and was troubled. Psalm 77.3 how came the remembrance of God to be a matter of trouble to him? In other places he professed that it was all his relief and support. How comes it to be an occasion of his trouble? All had not been well between God and him. And whereas formerly, in his remembrance of God, his thoughts were chiefly exercised about his love and kindness, now they were wholly engrossed with his own sin and unkindness. This causes his trouble. Herein lies a share of the entanglements occasioned by sin, saith such a soul in itself, foolish creature, hast thou thus requited the Lord? Is this the return that thou hast made to him, for all of his love, his kindness, his consolations and mercies? Is this thy love to him? Is this thy kindness to thy friend? Is this thy boasting of him that thou hadst found so much goodness and excellency in him and his love, that though all men should forsake him, thou never wouldest do so? 
and all thy promises, all thy engagements, which thou madest unto God in times of distress, upon prevailing obligations and mighty impressions of his good spirit upon thy soul, now come to this, that thou shouldest so foolishly forget, neglect, despise, cast him off. Well, now he is gone. He is withdrawn from thee, and what wilt thou do? Art thou not even ashamed to desire him to return? Thoughts of this nature cut Peter to the heart upon his fall. The soul finds them cruel as death, and strong as the grave. It is bound in their chains, and cannot be comforted. Psalm 38, 3-6 And herein consists a great part of the depths inquired after. For this consideration excites and puts an edge upon all grieving, straightening, perplexing affections, which are the only means in which the soul of man may be inwardly troubled or trouble itself. Such are sorrow and shame, with that self-displeasure and self-revenge in which they are attended. And as their reason and object in this case transcend all other occasions of them, so on no other account do they cause such severe and perplexing reflections in the soul as on this. Thirdly, a revived sense of justly deserved wrath belongs also to these depths. This is as the opening of old wounds, when men have passed through a sense of wrath, and have obtained deliverance and rest through the blood of Christ, to come to their old thoughts again, to be dealing afresh with hell, curse, law, and wrath, is a depth indeed. And this often befalls gracious souls on account of sin. Psalm 88, 7 Thy wrath lieth hard upon me, says the psalmist. It pressed and crushed him sorely. There is a self-judging as to the desert of wrath, which is consistent with a comforting persuasion of an interest in Christ. In that the soul finds sweetness, as it lies in a subserviency to the exaltation of grace. But in this case the soul is left under it without that relief. It plunges itself into the curse of the law and flames of hell without any cheering support from the blood of Christ. This is walking in the valley of the shadow of death. The soul converses with death and what seems to lie in attendancies thereunto. The Lord also, to increase his perplexities, puts new life and spirit into the law, gives it a fresh commission, as it were, to take such a one into its custody, and the law will never in this world be wanting to its duty. Fourthly, there are also oppressing apprehensions of temporal judgments. For God will judge his people, and judgments often begins at the house of God. Though God saith, Such a one should not cast me off forever, though he should pardon my iniquities, yet he may so take vengeance on my inventions, as to make me feed on gall and wormwood all my days. My flesh trembleth for fear of thee, and I am afraid of thy judgments. Psalm 119, 120 he knows not what the great God may bring upon him, and having a full sense of the guilt of sin, which is the ground of this whole condition, every judgment of God is full of terror to him. Sometimes he thinks God may lay open the vileness of his heart and make him a scandal and a reproach in the world. Oh, saith he, make me not the reproach of the foolish. Psalm 39, 8. Sometimes he trembles lest God should strike him suddenly with some signal judgment and take him out of the world in darkness and sorrow. So saith David, Take me not away in thy wrath. Sometimes he fears lest he should be like Jonah and raise a storm in his family, in the church whereof he is a member, or in the whole nation. Let them not be ashamed for my sake. These things make his heart soft, as Job speaks, and to melt within him. When any affliction or public judgment of God is joined to a quick living sense of sin in the conscience, it overwhelms the soul. Whether it be only justly feared or be actually inflicted, as was the case of Joseph's brethren in Egypt, the soul is enrolled from one deep to another. Sense of sin casts it on the consideration of its affliction, and affliction turns it back on a sense of sin. So deep calleth unto deep, and all God's billows go over the soul, and they do each of them make the soul tender and sharpen its sense unto the other. Affliction softens the soul so that the sense of sin cuts the deeper and makes a larger wound, and the sense of sin weakens the soul and makes affliction the heavier and 
so increases its burden. In this case, that affliction which a man in his usual state of spiritual peace could have embraced as a sweet pledge of love is as goads and thorns in his side, depriving him of all rest and quietness. God makes it as thorns and briars, wherewith he will teach stubborn souls their duty as Gideon did the men of Sukkoth. Fifthly, there may be added prevailing fears for a season of being utterly rejected by God, of being found a reprobate at the last day. Jonah seems to conclude so, chapter 2, 4. Then I said, I am cast out of thy sight. I am lost forever. God will own me no more. In Psalm 88, 4 and 5, I am counted with them that go down into the pit, free among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, whom thou rememberest no more, and they are cut off from thy hand. This may reach the soul until the sorrows of hell compass it, and lay hold upon it, until it be deprived of comfort, peace, and rest, until it be a terror to itself, and be ready to choose strangling rather than life. This may befall a gracious soul on account of sin, but yet because this war is directly against the life of faith, God doth not, unless in extraordinary cases, suffer any of his to lie long in this horrible pit, where there is no water, no refreshment. But it often occurs that even the saints themselves are left for a season to a fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, so as to the prevailing apprehensions of their minds. Sixthly, God secretly sends his arrows into the soul that wound it, adding pain to its disquietness. Thine arrow stick fast in me, and thy hand presseth me sore. Psalm 38, 2. Ever and anon in his walking, God shot a sharp, piercing arrow, fixing it in his soul, that wounded and perplexed him, filling him with pain and grievous vexation. These arrows are God's rebukes. When thou with rebukes dost correct man for iniquity, Psalm 39.11, God speaks in his word and by his spirit in the conscience things sharp and bitter to the soul, fastening them so that it cannot shake them off. These Job so mournfully complains of in chapter 6.4, the Lord speaks words with such efficacy that they pierce the heart quite through, and what the issue then is, David declares, There is no soundness, he says, in my flesh because of thine anger, nor is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. Psalm 38, 8. The whole person is brought under the power of them, and all health and rest is taken away. And 7. Dullness and disability to duty in doing their suffering attend such a condition. Mine iniquities have taken hold upon me so that I am not able to look up. Psalm 40.12 His spiritual strength was worn away by sin, so that he was not able to address himself to any communion with God. The soul now cannot pray with life and power, cannot hear with joy and profit, cannot do good and communicate with cheerfulness and freedom, cannot meditate with delight and heavenly mindedness, cannot act for God with zeal and liberty, cannot think of suffering with boldness and resolution, but is sick, weak feeble and bow down. Now I say a gracious soul after much communion with God may on account of sin by a sense of the guilt of it be brought into a state wherein some or all of these with other like perplexities may be its portion and these make up the depth whereof the psalmist here complains. I shall now show section 2 whence it is that believers may be brought into depth on account of sin. The nature of the covenant of grace wherein all believers now walk with God and wherein lies their whole provision for obedience leaves it possible for them to fall into these depths that have been mentioned. Under the first covenant, there was no mercy or forgiveness provided for any sin. He made man upright, and it was necessary that he should be preserved from every sin, or that covenant could in no way benefit him. But it is not so in the covenant of grace. There is a pardon provided in the blood of Christ. It is not, therefore, of indispensable necessity that there should be administered grace in it, effectually preserving from every sin, yet it is on all accounts to be preferred before the other. For besides a relief by pardon, which the other knew nothing of, there is in it also much provision against sin, which was not in the other. Number one, there is provision made in it against all and every sin that would disannul the covenant. 
and make a final separation between God and the soul that has been once taken into it. This provision is absolute. God has taken upon himself to make it good, to establish this law of the covenant, that it shall not by any sin be disannulled. I will, saith God, make an everlasting covenant with them, that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts, that they shall not depart from me. Jeremiah 32.40 The security depends not on anything in ourselves. All that is in us is to be used as a means for the accomplishment of this promise. But the event or issue depends absolutely on the faithfulness of God, and the whole certainty and stability of the covenant depends on the efficacy of the grace administered in it to preserve men from all such sins as would disannul it. Number two, there is in this covenant of grace provision made for constant peace and consolation, notwithstanding the guilt of such sins as, through their infirmities and temptations, believers are daily exposed to. Though they fall into sins every day, yet they do not fall into depths every day. In the tenor of this covenant, there is a consistency between a sense of sin unto humiliation and peace with strong consolation. After the apostle had described the whole conflict that believers have with sin, and the frequent wounds which they receive thereby, which makes them cry out for deliverance, Romans 7.24, he yet concludes, chapter 8.1, that there is no condemnation to them, which is a sufficient and stable foundation of peace. So 1 John 2.1, These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ, the righteous. Our great business and care ought to be that we sin not, but yet when we have done our utmost, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. What then shall poor sinful guilty creatures do? Why let them go to the Father by their advocate, and they shall not fail of pardon and peace. And saith Paul, God is abundantly willing that we might have strong consolation, who fly for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. Hebrews 6, 17 and 18. What was his condition who fled of old to the city of refuge for safety, from whence this expression is taken? He was guilty of blood, though shed unawares, and so that he was to die for it, if he escaped not to the city of refuge. Though we may have the guilt of sins on which the law pronounces death, yet flying to Christ for refuge, God has provided not only safety but strong consolation. Forgiveness in the blood of Christ not only takes guilt from the soul, but trouble also from the conscience, and in this respect the apostle at large sets forth the excellency of his sacrifice. Hebrews 10. The sacrifices of the law, he tells us, could not make perfect the worshippers, which he proves because they did never take away, thoroughly and really, conscience of sin, that is, depths or distresses of conscience about sin. But now, he says, Jesus Christ, in the covenant of grace, has forever perfected them that were sanctified, provided for them such stable peace and consolation that they should not need the renewing of sacrifices every day. This is the great mystery of the gospel in the blood of Christ, that those who sin every day should have peace with God all their days, if their sins fall within the compass of those infirmities against which this consolation is provided. Number three, there is provision made of grace to preserve the soul from great and enormous sins, such as in their own nature are apt to wound conscience and cast a person into depths in which he shall have neither rest nor peace. There is in this covenant grace for grace, John 1.16, an abundance of grace administered from the fullness of Christ. Grace reigneth in it. Romans 6.6, 6, destroying and crucifying the body of sin. But this provision in the covenant of grace against peace ruining, soul perplexing sins is not, as to the administration of it, absolute. There are covenant commands and exhortations on the attendance upon which the administration of much covenant grace depends. To watch, pray, improve faith, to stand on our guard continually, to mortify sin, to fight against temptations with steadfastness, diligence, constancy, are everywhere prescribed, and that in order to the assurance of the grace mentioned. So Peter informs us the divine power of God has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Second Epistle 1, verse 3. We have from it an habitual supply and provision for obedience at all times. Also, he says in verse 4, He has given unto us great and precious promises, that by them we might be partakers of the divine nature. 
What then in this blessed estate and condition is required of us, but that we may make a due improvement of the provision made for us, and enjoy the comforting influence of those promises that he holds out to us? Verses 5-7 to seven. Giving all diligence add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. That is, carefully and diligently attend to the exercise of all the graces of the Spirit, and to a conversation in all things becoming the gospel. What then shall be the issue if these things are attended to? Verse 8. If these things be in you and abound, ye shall be th- neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is not enough that these things be in you, that you have the root of them from the Holy Ghost, but you are to take care that they flourish and abound, without which, though the root of the manner may be in you, and so you be not wholly devoid of spiritual life, yet you will be poor, barren, sapless, withering creatures all your days. But now suppose that these things do abound, and we be made fruitful by them. Why then does he say, verse 10, If you do these things, you shall never fall. What? Never fall into sin? Nay, that is not the promise. And he that says, when he has done all, that he has no sin, he is a liar. Or is it, never fall totally from God? Nor the preservation of the elect of whom he speaks from total apostasy is not suspended on such conditions, especially not on any degree of them, such as their abounding imports. But it is that they shall not fall into their old sins from which they were purged. Verse 9. Such conscious wasting and defiling sins as they lived in, in a time and state of their unregeneracy. Thus, though there be in the covenant of grace through Jesus Christ, provision made of abundant supplies for the soul's preservation from entangling sins, yet their administration has respect unto our diligent attendance on the appointed means of receiving them. And here lies the latitude of the new covenant. Here lies the exercise of renewed free will. This is the field of free voluntary obedience under the administration of gospel grace. There are extremes which in respect to the event it is not concerned in. To be wholly perfect, to be free from every sin, all failings, all infirmities, is not provided for nor promised in this covenant. It is a covenant of mercy and pardon which supposes a continuance of sin. To fall utterly and finally from God is provided against. Between these two extremes of absolute perfection and total apostasy lies a large field of believers' obedience in walking with God. Many a sweet heavenly passage there is, and many a dangerous depth in this field. Some walk near to the one side, some to the other. Yea, the same person may sometimes press hard after perfection, sometimes wander to the very border of destruction. Now between these two lie many a soul-plunging sin, against which no absolute provision is made, and of which, for want of all giving of diligence, believers fall. Number four, there is not in the covenant of grace provision made of ordinary and abiding consolation for any under the guilt of sins greatly aggravated which they fall into by neglecting the condition of abounding grace just named. Sins there are which, either because in their own nature they wound and waste the conscience, or in their effects break forth into scandal, causing the name of God and the gospel to be evil spoken of, or in some of their circumstances are full of unkindness against God, do deprive the soul of its wanted consolation. How, by what means, on what account such sins came to terrify conscience, to break the bones, to darken the soul, and to cast it into inextricable depths, notwithstanding a relief that is provided of pardon in the blood of Christ, I shall not now declare. They that will do so, and that consolation is not of equal extent with safety, we know. Hence God assumes it to himself as an act of mere sovereign grace to speak peace and refreshment to the souls of his saints in their depths of sin entanglements. Isaiah 57, 18 and 19. And indeed, if the Lord had not thus provided that great provocation should stand in need of special release, it might justly be feared that the negligence of believers might possibly produce much bitter fruit. Only this must be observed, by the way, that what is spoken relates to the sins of sinners in their own souls, and not to the nature of the thing itself. There is in the gospel consolation provided against the greatest as well as the least sins. The difference arises from God's sovereign communication of it, according to the tenor of the covenant's administration, which we have laid down. 
Hence, because under Moses' law there was an exception of some sins, for which there was no sacrifice appointed, so that those who were guilty of them could no way be justified from them, that is, carnally, as to their interest in the Judaical church and polity. Paul tells the Jews that through Jesus Christ was preached unto them the forgiveness of sins, and that by him all that believe are justified from all things, from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. Acts 13, 38, and 39. There is now no exception of any particular sins as to pardon and peace, but what we have spoken relates to the manner wherein God is pleased to administer consolation to the souls of sinning believers. Having shown that the covenant of grace leaves it possible that the souls of believers should fall into inextricable depths, I proceed more directly to show whence it is that they often do actually thus fall. First, from indwelling sin, as it remains in the best of saints in this life. For though the strength of every sin be weakened by grace, yet the root of no sin in this life is wholly taken away. Lust is like the stubborn Canaanites, who after the general conquest of the land would dwell in it still. Judges 1.27 Indeed, when Israel grew strong, they brought them under tribute, but they could not utterly expel them. The kingdom and rule belongs to grace. And when it grows strong, it brings sin much under, but it will not wholly be driven out. The body of death is not to be utterly done away, but in the death of the body. In the flesh of the best saints there dwelleth no good thing, Romans 7.18. But the contrary is there, that is, the root of all evil. The flesh lusteth against the spirit, as the spirit lusteth against the flesh, Galatians 5.17. As then there is a universality in the actings of the spirit in its opposing all evil, so there is a universality in the actings of the flesh for the furtherance of it. Some lusts or branches of original corruption obtain in some person such advantages, either from nature, custom, employment, society, or other circumstances, that they become like the Canaanites that had iron chariots. It is a very difficult thing to subdue them. Well, it is if war be maintained constantly against them, for they will almost always be in actual rebellion. In dwelling sin, though weak and retains all its properties, the properties of a thing follow its nature. Where the nature of anything is, there are all its natural properties. What are these properties of indwelling sin, I should here declare, but that I have handled the whole power and efficacy, the nature and properties of it, in another treatise. In brief, they are such that it is no wonder that some believers are by them cast into depths, but it is indeed wonderful that any escape them. Secondly, the power and prevalence of temptation, which because as I have already shown in another discourse, I shall not here further insist upon. That is a treatise of temptation also available on Sermon Audio. Number three, the sovereign pleasure of God in dealing with sinning saints must also be considered. Divine love and wisdom work not towards all in the same manner. God is pleased to continue peace to some, notwithstanding great provocations. Love shall humble them, and rebukes of kindness shall recover them from their wanderings. Others he is pleased to bring into the depths we have been speaking of. But yet I may say generally, signal provocations meet with one of these two events from God first. Those in whom they are are left to some signal barrenness and fruitlessness in their generation. They wither, grow barren, worldly, and sapless, and are much cast out of the hearts of the people of God. Or number two, they are exercised in these depths from whence their way of deliverance is laid down in this psalm. Thus I say, God deals with the saints in great variety. Some have all their bones broken, when others have only the gentle strokes of the rod. We are in the hands of mercy, and God may deal with us as seems good unto him. But great sins ought to be attended with expectation of great depths and perplexities. Section 3. What sins usually bring believers into great spiritual distresses? Sins in their own nature, wasting conscience are of this sort. Sins that rise in opposition to all of God that is in us, that is the light of grace in nature also, such are the sins that cast David into depths. 
Such are the sins enumerated, 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10. Be not deceived, said the apostle, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Certain it is that believers may fall into some of the sins here mentioned. Some have done so, as is left on record. The apostle says, not those who have committed any of these sins, but such sinners shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That is, who live in these, or any of these sins, or any like them. There is no provision of mercy made for such sinners. These are sins which in their own nature, without the consideration of aggravating circumstances, plunge a soul into depth. These sins cut the locks of men's spiritual strength, and it is in vain for them to say, We will go and do as at other times. Bones are not broken without pain, nor great sins brought on the conscience without trouble. But I need not insist on these. Some say that they deprive even true believers of all their interest in the love of God, but unduly. All grant that they bereave them of all comforting evidence and well-grounded assurance of it. So they did David and Peter, and herein lies no small part of the depths we are searching into. But these are sins which, though they do not rise up in the conscience with such a bloody guilt as those mentioned, yet by reason of their aggravations, God makes them a root of disquietness and trouble to the soul all its days. He says of some sins of ungodly men, As I live, this iniquity shall not be purged from you until ye die. If you are come to this height, you shall not escape. I will not spare you. And there are such provocations in his own people that he will not let them pass before he has cast them into depths and made them cry out for deliverance. Let us consider some of them. Number one, sins under signal enjoyments of love and kindness from God are of this sort. When God has given unto any one expressive manifestations of his love, convinced him of it, made him say in the inmost parts of his heart, this is undeserved love and kindness, then for him to be negligent in walking with God and is, is an aggravation that shall not be forgotten. It is a remark upon the sins of Solomon that he fell into them after God had appeared unto him twice. And all sins under or after special mercies will meet at one time or other with special rebukes. Nothing more distresses the conscience of a sinner than the remembrance in darkness of abused light in desertions of neglected love. This God will make him sensible of. Though I have redeemed them, saith God, yet they have spoken lies against me. When God has in his providence dealt graciously with a person, it may be delivered him from straits and troubles, set him in a large place, blessed him in his person, relations, and employments, dealt well with his soul in giving him a gracious sense of his love in Christ. For such a one to fall in a sin goes to the heart of God and shall not be passed over. Under valuations of love are great provocations. Hath Nabal thus requited my kindness, saith David, I cannot bear it. And the clearer our convictions of sins, the more severe will be our reflections upon ourselves. Number two, sins under or after great afflictions are also of this character. God doth not afflict willingly or chasten us merely for his pleasure. He does it to make us partakers of his holiness. To take so little notice of his hand as under it or after it, not to watch against the workings of surprisals of sin, has unkindness in it. I smote him, saith God, and he went on forwardly in the ways of his own heart. These provocations of his sons and daughters he cannot bear with. Has God brought thee into the furnace, so that thou hast melted under his hand, and in pity and compassion given thee enlargement? If thou hast soon forgotten his dealings with thee, is it any wonder if he reminds thee by troubles in thy soul? Number three, breaking off from under strong convictions and drawings of love before conversion is often remembered upon the conscience afterwards. When the Lord, by his Spirit, shall mightily convince the heart of sin, and make to it withal some discoveries of his love, and the excellencies of Christ, 
so that it begins to yield and be overpowered. Being almost persuaded to be a Christian, if then, through the strength of lust or unbelief, it goes back to the world or self-righteousness, its folly has unkindness with it, which sometimes shall not be passed by. God can and often does put forth the greatness of his power for the recovery of such a soul, but yet he will deal with them about this contempt of his love and the excellency of his Son which had been manifested to him. Number four, sudden forgetfulness of endearing manifestations of special love. This God cautions his people against, is knowing their proneness to it. God the Lord will speak peace to his people and the saints, but let them not turn again to folly. Psalm 85, verse 8. Let them take heed of their aptness to forget endearing manifestations of special love. When God at any time draws nigh to a soul by his spirit and his word, with gracious words of peace and love, giving a sense of his kindness on the heart by the Holy Ghost, so that it is filled with joy unspeakable and glorious, for this soul on a temptation, a diversion, or by mere carelessness and neglect, to suffer the sense of love to be, as it were, obliterated, and so lose that efficacy to obedience with which it is accompanied, this also is full of unkindness. Number five, great opportunities neglected and great gifts not improved are often the occasion of plunging the soul into great depths. Gifts are given to trade with for God. Opportunities are the market days for that trade. To hide the one in a napkin and let the other slip will end in trouble. Disquietments and perplexities of heart are worms that will certainly breed in the rust of unexercised gifts. God loses a revenue of glory and honor by such slothful souls, and he will make them sensible of it. I know some of this day whom omission of opportunities for service are ready to sink into the grave. Number six, sins after special warning. In all that variety of special warnings which God is pleased to use towards sinning saints, I shall single out the one only. When a soul is wrestling with some lust or temptation, God by his providence causes some special word in the preaching of the gospel or the administration of some ordinance peculiarly suited to the state of the soul and the way of rebuke or persuasion to come nigh and enter the inmost heart. The soul cannot but take notice that God is nigh to him, that he is dealing with him, and calling on him to look to him for assistance. And he seldom gives such warnings to his saints, but that he is nigh them in an imminent manner to give them relief and help. If, in answer to his call, they apply themselves to him, but if his care and kindness be neglected, his reproofs are usually more severe. Number seven, sins that bring scandal seldom suffer the soul to escape depths. Even in great sins, God in chastening takes more notice often of the scandal than the sin, as Second Samuel 12:14. Many professors take little notice of their worldliness, their pride, their passion, their lavish tongues. But the world does, and the gospel is dishonored by it. And no wonder if they find from the hand of the Lord the bitter fruits. Many other aggravations of sins there are, not perhaps in their own nature so appalling as some others, but which plunge the soul into depth. Those which have been named may suffice as illustrations, which is all we have aimed at the depths of sin. The consideration of some aggravations of the guilt of these sins, which usually bring the soul into the condition described, shall close these remarks. Number one, the soul is furnished with a principle of grace, which is continually operative and working for its preservation from such sins. The new creature is living and active from its own growth, increase, and security, according to the tenor of the covenant of grace. It lusteth against the flesh, it is naturally active for its own preservation and increase, as newborn children have a natural inclination to the food that will keep them alive and cause them to grow. The soul, then, cannot fall into these entangling sins, but it must be with the high neglect of, of that very principle which is bestowed upon it for quite contrary ends and purposes. The laborings, lustings, desires, crying of it are neglected. It is from God and of God, and is a renovation of its image in us. That which God owns and cares for, and the wounding of its vitals and stifling of its operations, the neglect of its endeavors for the soul's preservation, always attend sins of such magnitude. 
Number two, as this principle of life and obedience is not able of itself to preserve the soul from such sins as will bring it into depths, there is full provision for continual supplies of it in Jesus Christ. There are treasures of relief in Christ to which the soul may at any time repair and find succor against the incursions of sin. He says to the soul, as David to Abiathar, when he fled from Doeg, Abide with me, fear not. He that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safety. Sin is my enemy no less than thine. It seeks the life of thy soul, and it seeks my life. Abide with me, for with me you shall be in safety. To this the Apostle exhorts us, Let us come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4.16 If ever it be a time of need with a soul, it is when under the assaults of provoking sins. At such a time there is suitable and seasonable help in Christ for succor and relief. The new creature begs with sighs and groans that the soul would apply itself unto him. To neglect him with all his provision of grace while he stands calling to us, Open unto me, for my head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night, cannot but be a high provocation. And what think we is the heart of Christ? When he sees his children given way to conscience-wasting sins, without that application to him which the life and peace of their own soul calls upon them for, these are not sins of daily infirmity which cannot be escaped, but their guilt is always attended with a neglect, more or less, of the relief provided in Christ against them. The means of preservation from them is blessed, ready, nigh at hand. The interest of Christ in our preservation great, of our souls unspeakable, to neglect and despise means. Christ, our own soul's peace and life, must render guilt very guilty. Chapter 2 Relief in God Alone The remaining words of the first two verses of the psalm show the acting of the soul in the depths described, that it may gain relief. I have cried unto thee, O Lord, Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. A general application for relief is here made, in which is first to be considered, to whom the application is made, and that is Jehovah. I have cried unto thee, Jehovah. God gave that name to his people to confirm their faith in the stability of his promise. Exodus 3. Being to deal with God about the promise of grace, he makes his application to him under this name. I call upon thee, Jehovah. In the application it may be observed that he prays that God would cause his ears to be attentive after the manner of men who seriously attend to what is spoken to them when they turn aside from that which they regard not. Also the earnestness of the soul in this supplication, which is evident, both from the reduplication of its request, Lord, hear my voice, let thine ears be attentive to my voice, and the emphatical nature of the words he uses, let thine ears be, in the Hebrew, diligently attentive. The word signifies the most diligent heedfulness and close attention. Let thine ears be very attentive, and unto what? To the voice of my supplication generally say interpreters of my deprecations or earnest prayers for the averting of evil or punishment. But the word is to be gracious or merciful so that it signifies properly supplications for grace. Be attentive, O Lord, to my supplications for grace and mercy, which according to my extreme necessity I now make unto thee. And in these words the psalmist sets forth in general the frame and working of a gracious soul cast into depth and darkness by sin. We hence derive these two propositions. The only attempt of a sin-entangled soul for relief lies in an application to God alone. To thee, Jehovah, have I cried, Lord, hear. Depths of sin entanglements will excite a gracious soul to intense and earnest supplications to God. Lord, hear. Lord, attend. Dying men do not usually cry out slothfully for relief. Number one, trouble, danger, disquietude invariably lead us to seek relief. A drowning man needs no exhortation to endeavor his own deliverance and safety, and spiritual troubles in like manner put men on attempts for relief. To seek for no remedy is to be senselessly obdurate or wretchedly desperate as Cain and Judas. We may suppose, then, that the principal business of every soul in depths is to endeavor deliverance. They cannot rest in that condition wherein they have no rest. 
In this endeavor, what course a gracious soul takes is laid down in the first proposition negatively and positively. He applies not to anything but God. He applies himself to God. An imminent instance of this we have in Hosea 14.3. As sure, saith those poor distressed, returning sinners, shall not save us. We will not ride upon horses, neither will we say any more to the work of our hands. Ye are our gods, for in thee the fatherless findeth mercy. Their application to God is attended with a renunciation of every other way of relief. Several things there are that sinners are apt to apply themselves to for relief in their perplexities, which proves as waters that fail. How many things have the Romanists invented to deceive souls? Saints and angels, the Blessed Virgin, the Wood of the Cross, confessions, penances, masses, pilgrimages, and dirges, purgatories, papal pardons, works of compensation, and the like are made entrances for innumerable souls into everlasting ruin. Did they know the terror of the Lord, the nature of sin, and the mediation of Christ, they would be ashamed and confounded in themselves for these abominations. They would not say to these idols, Ye are our gods, come and save us. How short do their contrivances come of his who would fain offer rivers of oil, yea, the fruit of his body for the sin of his soul, his firstborn for his transgression, Micah 6, 7, who yet gains nothing but an aggravation of his sin and misery thereby. Yea, the heathen went beyond them in devotion and expense. It is no new inquiry what course in perplexed souls should take for relief. From the foundation of the world, the minds of far the greatest part of mankind have been exercised in it. Among those who were ignorant of God, this inquiry brought forth all that diabolical superstition which spread over the face of the world. Gentilism being destroyed by the power and efficacy of the gospel, the same inquiry working in the minds of darkened men in conjunction with other lusts brought forth the papacy. When men had lost a spiritual acquaintance with the covenant of grace and mystery of the gospel, the design of eternal love and efficacy of the blood of Christ, they betook themselves for relief under their entanglements to the broken cisterns mentioned. This mistake is predominant in all that are under the law, that is, to seek for relief in sin distresses by self-endeavors, self-righteousness. Hence many poor souls and straight supply but to themselves. They expect their cure from the same hands that wounded them. This is the life of Judaism, as the Apostle informs us, Romans 10.3, and all men under the law are still animated by the same principle. They return, but not unto the Lord. Finding themselves in distress for sin, what course do they take? They do this. As they have offended, so they will amend, and expect their peace to spring from thence, as if God and they stood on equal terms. In this way, some spend their days sinning and amending, amending and sinning, without once coming to repentance and peace. This the souls of believers watch against. They look on themselves as fatherless. In thee the fatherless findeth mercy." that is, helpless, without the least ground of hope in themselves, or expectation from themselves. They know their repentance, their amendment, their supplications, their humiliations, their fastings, their mortifications will not relieve them. Repent they will, and amend they will, and pray and fast and humble their souls, for they know these things to be their duty, but they know that their goodness extends not to him with whom they have to do, nor is he profited by their righteousness. They will be in the performance of all duties, but they expect not deliverance by any duty. It is God, they say, with whom we have to do. Our business is to hear what he will say unto us. There are other ways whereby sinful souls destroy themselves by false reliefs. A diversion from their perplexing thoughtfulness pleases them. They will fix on something that cannot cure their disease, but may make them forget that they are sick. Is Cain, under the terror of his guilt, departed from the presence of the Lord, and sought inward rest and outward labor and employment? He went and built a city. Genesis 4.17 such courses Saul fixed on first music, then a witch. Nothing is more common than for men thus to deal with their convictions. They see their sickness, feel their wound, and go to the Assyrian, Hosea 5.13. And this insensibly leads men into atheism. 
Frequent resort to creature diversions from convictions of sin is a great means of bringing on final impenitency. Some drunkards had, it may be, never been so, had they not been first convinced of other sins. They strive to stifle the guilt of one sin with another. They fly from themselves, from their conscience to their lusts and seek for relief from sin by sinning. This is so far from believers that they will not allow lawful things to be a diversion of their distress. Use lawful things they may and will, but not to divert their thoughts from their distresses. These they know must be issued between God and them, whereof they will not, but must be taken away. These rocks a gracious soul takes care to avoid. He knows it is God alone against whom he has sinned, and God alone who can pardon his sin. To thee, O Lord, do I come. Thy word concerning me must stand. Upon thee will I wait. If thou hast no delight in me, I must perish. Other remedies I know are vain. I intend not to spend my strength for that which is not bread. Unto thee do I cry. Here a sin-entangled soul is to fix itself. Trouble excites it to look for relief. Many things without present themselves as a diversion. Many things within offer themselves for a remedy. Forget thy sorrow, say the former. Ease thyself of it by us, say the latter. The soul refuses both as physicians of no value, and a God alone makes its application. He is wounded, and he alone can heal. And until anyone that is sensible of the guilt of sin will come off from all reserves to deal immediately with God, it is in vain for him to expect relief. Section 2 In its application to God alone, the soul is intense, earnest, and urgent. It is no time now to be slothful. The soul's all, its greatest concerns, are at stake. Dull, cold, formal applications to God will not serve the turn. Ordinary actings of faith, love, and fervency, usual seasons, opportunities, duties answer not this condition. To do no more than ordinary now is to do nothing at all. He that puts forth no more strength and activity for his deliverance, when he is in depth ready to perish, than when he is at liberty in plain and smooth paths is scarcely like to escape. Some in such conditions are careless and negligent. They think an ordinary course to wear off their difficulties, and that, though at present they are sensible of their danger, they shall have peace at last, in which frame there is much contempt of God. Some despond and languish under their distresses. Spiritual sloth influences both these classes. But the steadfast soul resolves, by whatsoever means, public or private, of communion with others or solitary retiredness, Christ ever was or may be found, peace be obtained. I will seek him and not give over until I come to an enjoyment of him. In this frame, this resolution of soul in depth must come unto, if ever it expect deliverance. For the most part, men's wounds stink and are corrupt because of their foolishness. As the psalmist complains, Psalm 38, 5, they are wounded by sin, and through spiritual sloth they neglect their cure. This weakens them and disquiets them day by day, yet they endure all rather than they will come out of their carnal ease to deal effectually with God. It was otherwise with David. Why, he says, art thou so far from helping me, and from the words of my roaring? Oh, my God, I cry in the daytime and in the night season, and am not silent. Psalm 22, 1 and 2. What ails the man? Can he not be quiet, night or day? Never be silent, never hold his peace? And if he be somewhat disquieted, can he not contain himself, but he must roar and cry out? Yea, must he roar thus all the day long? Psalm 32, verse 3. And groan all the night? Is Psalm 6, 6. What is the cause of all this roaring, sighing, and tears? Ah, let him alone. His soul is bitter in him. He has fallen into depths. The Lord is withdrawn from him. Yea, he is full of anxiety on account of sin. There is no quietness nor soundness in him, and he must thus earnestly and restlessly apply himself for relief. Alas, what strangers for the most part are men to the state of soul. How little of the workings of the Spirit is found amongst us, and is not the reason of it that we value the world more and heaven and heavenly things less than he did? 
that we think we can live without a sense of the love of God in Christ, and is not hence that we see so many withering professors without communion with God, who will go on ready to perish rather than with this holy man thus stir up themselves to meet the Lord. My soul saith he is full of troubles, and my life draweth nigh unto the grave. And how did he act in this heavy, disconsolate condition? O Lord God of my salvation, I have cried day and night unto thee. Let my prayer come before thee. Incline thine ear unto my cry. Verses 1 and 2. Day and night he cries to the God of his salvation, and that with earnestness and importunity. The greatest of men's interests may well occasion this earnestness. Suppose a man of the world should have his house wherein all his stock and riches are laid up, set on fire. Would he be calm and quiet in the consideration of it? Would he not bestir himself with all his might and call in all the help he could obtain, and that because his portion, his all, his great interest is at stake? And shall the soul be slothful, careless, and secure when the light of God's countenance, which is more to him than the greatest increase of corn and wine can be to the men of the world? is removed from him? What a fatal sense of security did it argue in Jonah, that he was fast asleep when the ship was ready to be cast away for his sake. And will it be thought less than any soul who, being in a storm of wrath and displeasure from God, sent out into the deep after him, shall neglect it, and sleep, as Solomon says, on the top of a mast in the midst of the sea? How did that poor creature whose heart was mad on his idols, Judges 18.24, cry out when he was deprived of them, You have taken away my gods, and what have I more? And shall a gracious soul through his own folly lose his God? The sense of his love, the consolation of his presence, and not with all his might follow hard after him? Could such forbear crying out with Job, Oh, that it were with us as in former days when the candle of the Lord was upon our tabernacle? Chapter 29, 2 and 4. And with David, O Lord, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Psalm 51, 12. But suppose they might pass on in their pilgrimage whilst all is prosperous about them. What will they do in the time of outward trials and distresses when deep calleth unto deep, and one trouble excites and sharpens another? Nothing then will support them, they know, but that which is now wanting. Again, they have a deep sense of these their great concerns. All men equally need the love of God and pardon of sin. Everyone has a soul of a mortal constitution, capable of bliss and woe. Yet most men are so stupidly sottish that they take little notice of these things. Neither the guilt of sin, nor the wrath of God, nor death, nor hell can arouse them. But gracious souls have a quick living sense of spiritual things. They have a spiritual light whereby they discern the true nature of sin and the terror of the Lord. For though they may now have lost the comforting, they lose not the sanctifying light of the Spirit, the light whereby they are enabled to discern spiritual things in a spiritual manner. This never utterly departs from them. By this they see sin to be exceeding sinful. By this they know the terror of the Lord, and that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. By this they discover the excellency of the love of God in Christ, which passes knowledge, the present sense in which they have lost. By this they are enabled to look within the veil and to take a view of the blessed consolations which the saints enjoy, whose communion with God is never interrupted. This represents to them all the joy and peace which in former days they had whilst God was present with them in love, and they are taught to value all the fruits of the blood of Jesus Christ. They remember what it cost them formally to deal with God about sin, and hence they know it is no ordinary matter they have in hand. A recovery from depths is as a new conversion. Oft times in it the whole work as to the soul's apprehension is gone over afresh. This the soul knows to have been a work of dread, terror, and trouble, and trembles in itself at its new trials. The Holy Ghost gives them a fresh sense of their deep concerns on purpose to stir them up to these earnest applications to God. 
the whole work is his, and he carries it on by means suited to the end. And by these means is a gracious soul brought into the state mentioned. In this work, several things concur. Number one, a continual thoughtfulness about the sad condition of the soul in its depths. Thine arrow stick fast in me, and thy hand presses me sore. There is no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger, neither is there any rest in my bones because of my sin. For mine iniquities are gone over mine head, as a heavy burden they are too heavy for me. My wounds stink and are corrupt because of my foolishness. I am troubled, I am bowed down, I go mourning all the day long. I am feeble and sore broken. I have roared for the disquietness of my heart. Psalm 38, 2-8 Restlessness, disquietness of heart, continual heaviness of soul, sorrow and anxiety lie at the bottom of the applications we are speaking of. From these principles, their prayers flow out, as David adds, verse 9, Lord, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. He prayed out of the abundance of his meditation and grief. Thoughts of their condition lie down with such persons and rise with them and accompany them all the day long. As Reuben cried, The child is not, and I, whither shall I go? So does such a soul. The love of God is not, Christ is not, and whither shall I cause my sorrow to go? God is provoked, death is nigh at hand, relief is far away, darkness is about me, I have lost my peace, my joy, my song in the night. What do I think of duties? Can two walk together unless they be agreed? Can I walk with God in them while I have thus made him mine enemy? What do I think of ordinances? Will it do me any good to be at Jerusalem and not see the face of the king? To live under ordinances and not to meet in them with the king of saints? May I not justly fear that the Lord will take his Holy Spirit from me until I be left without remedy? With such thoughts as these are sin and tangled souls exercised in all their applications to God. Number two, we see the application itself consists in crying unto God. Now this is done with intenseness of mind. It is said of our blessed Savior that when he was in depths for our sins, he offered up prayers and supplication with strong cries and tears. Hebrews 5, 7. Strong cries and tears express the utmost intensity of spirit. David expresses it by roaring, as we have seen, as also by sighing groaning and panting. A soul in such a condition lies down before the Lord with sighs, groans, mourning, cries, tears, and roaring, according to the various workings of his heart. And this produces importunity. The power of the importunity of our faith, our Savior has marvelously set forth. Luke 11, 8-10, is also in chapter 18, 1. Importunate prayer is prevailing, and importunity is, as it were, made up of these two things, frequency of interposition and variety of arguings. A man that is importunate will come to you seven times a day about the same business, and after all, if any new thought come into his mind, though he had resolved to the contrary, he will come again, and nothing can be imagined to relate to the business he has in hand, but he will turn it to the furtherance of his plea. So is it in this case. Men will use both frequency of interposition and variety of arguings. I cry unto thee daily, or rather, all the day, Psalm 88, 1. By this means we give God no rest, which is a very character of importunity. Such souls go to God, and they are not satisfied with what they have done, but they go again and again. What variety of arguments are pleaded with God I could show in the history of David, but it is known to all. There is hardly anything that he does not make a plea of. The faithfulness, righteousness, name, mercy goodness and kindness of God in Jesus Christ, the concern of others in him, both the friends and foes of God, his own weakness and helplessness, yea, the greatness of sin itself. Be merciful to my sin, saith he, for it is great. Sometimes he begins with some arguments of this kind, and then, being a little diverted by other considerations, some new plea is suggested to him by the Spirit, and he returns immediately to his first employment and design, all arguing great intensity of mind and spirit. 
constancy also flows from intenseness. Such a soul will not give over until it obtains what it looks for, as we shall see in further considering this psalm. This is, in general, the deportment of a gracious soul in the condition here represented. As poor creatures love their peace, as they love their souls, as they value the glory of God, they must not be wanting in this duty. What is the reason that controversies hang so long between God and your souls that, it may be, you scarce see a good day all your lives? Is it not for the most part from your sloth and despondency of spirit? You will not gird up the loins of your mind in dealing with God to put them to a speedy issue in the blood of Christ, you go on and off, begin and cease, try and give over, and for the most part, though your case be extraordinary, content yourselves with ordinary and customary applications to God. This makes you wither, become useless, and pine away under your perplexities. David did not so, but after many and many a breach made by sin, through quick, vigorous, restless actings of faith, all was repaired so that ye live peaceably and die triumphantly. Up then and be doing, make thorough work of that which lies before you, be it long or difficult, it must be done, and is attended with safety. To Forgiveness of Sin, Chapter 3, God's Mark in Iniquity the general frame of a gracious soul and his perplexities about sin has been declared. His particular actings are next represented unto us in verse 3. If thou, Lord, shouldest mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? If thou, Lord. He here fixes on another name of God, which is Jah, a name from the same root with the former, but used to intimate and express the terrible majesty of God. He rideth on the heavens and is extolled by his name, Jah. Psalm 68.4 He is to deal now with God about the guilt of sin, and God is represented to the soul as great and terrible, that he may know what to expect if the matter must be tried according to the demerit of sin. If thou shouldest mark iniquities, that is, so consider and observe them as to reserve them for punishment and vengeance. In opposition to this marking, God is said not to see sin, to overlook it to cover it, to remember it no more. That is, to forgive it as the next verse declares. I need not show that God so far marks all sins and all persons as to see them, know them, disallow them, and to be displeased with them. This cannot be denied, without taking away all the grounds of fear and worship. To deny it is equivalent to denying the very being of God. Deny His holiness and righteousness, and you deny His existence. But there is a day appointed wherein all men shall know that God knew and took notice of all and every one of their most secret sins. There is then a double marking of sin in God, neither of which can be denied in reference unto any sins and any persons. The first is natural, consisting of his omniscience, whereunto all things are open and naked. Thus no sin is hid from him. The most secret is before the light of his countenance. All are marked by him. The other, moral, and a displeasure against every sin, which is inseparable from the nature of God on account of his holiness. And this is declared in the sentence of the law, and that equally to all men. But the marking here intended implies animadversion and punishment according to the tenor of the law. Not only the sentence of the law, but a will of punishing according to it is included in it. If, says the psalmist, Thou the great and dreadful God, who art extolled by thy glorious name, Jah, shouldest take notice of iniquity, so as to recompense sinners that come unto thee according to the severity of thy holy law, what then? It is answered by the proposal, Who can stand? That is, none can stand, no man, not one in the world can stand or abide the trial. Every one on this supposition must perish in that eternally. This, the desert of sin, and the curse of the law, which is the rule of thus marking their iniquity, require. There is great emphasis in the form of this interrogation. When the Holy Ghost would show the certainty and dreadfulness of the perdition of ungodly men, he does it by such a kind of expression wherein there is a deeper sense intimated than any words can well clothe or declare. What then shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel? 1 Peter 4.17 and verse 18. Where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? So here, who can stand? There is a deep insinuation of a dreadful ruin, 
as to all with whom God shall so deal as to mark their iniquities. See Psalm 1, verse 5. The psalmist then, addressing himself to deal with God about sin, lays down in the first place in general what the result must be, not to himself only, but to all the world, should God mark iniquity. This is not my case only, but it is so with all mankind. Every one who is partaker of flesh and blood, whether their guilt answer that which I am oppressed with or not, guilty are they all, and all must perish. How much more must that be my condition, who have contracted such guilt as I have done? Here, then, he brings a great argument against himself. If none, not the holiest, the humblest, the most believing soul can abide the trial, how much less can I, who am the chief of sinners, the least of saints, who come unspeakably behind them in holiness, and have equally gone beyond them in sin? This is the sense and import of the words. Let us now consider how they are expressive of the actings of the soul, whose state is here represented, and what directions they afford for them who are fallen into this state. We may here observe that, in God's marking sin according to the tenor of the law, the case is the same with all classes of sinners, whether before conversion or in relapses and entanglements after conversion. There is a likeness between conversion and recoveries. They are both wrought by the same means and have the same effects upon the souls of sinners, although in a number of things they differ. The considerations we now present may be applied both to those who are yet unconverted and to those who are really delivered from their natural state, but especially to those who know not which state they are in, that is, to all guilty souls. The law will put its claim upon all. It will condemn the sin and try what it can do against the sinner. There is no shaking it off. It must be fairly answered or it will prevail. The law issues an arrest for the debt, and it is to no purpose to bid the officer be gone or to entreat him to spare. If payment be not made and an acquittance produced, the soul must be sent to prison. I am going to God, saith the soul. He is great and terrible, a marker of sin, and what shall I say unto him? This makes him tremble and cry out, O Lord, who shall stand? Hence we lay down this proposition. In a sin-perplexed soul's addresses to God, the first thing that presents itself is God's mark and sin according to the tenor of the law, which is likely to fill the soul with dread and terror. The Lord speaks of some who, when they hear the words of the curse, yet bless themselves and say they shall have peace. Deuteronomy 29.19 Let men preach and say what they will of the terror of the Lord, they will despise it. This conduct God threatens with utter extermination. Generally it is with sinners as it was with Gaal, the son of Ebed, when he was fortifying Sychem against Abimelech. Zebul tells him that Abimelech will come and destroy him. Let him come, says Gaal. I shall deal well enough with him. Let him bring forth his army. I fear him not. But upon the very first appearance of Abimelech's army, he trembled for fear. Tell obdurate sinners of the wrath of God, and that he will come to plead his cause against them. For the most part they take no notice of what you say, but go on as if they were resolved they should deal well enough with him. Notwithstanding all their stoutness, a day is coming wherein fearfulness shall surprise them and make them cry out, Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Yea, if the Lord be pleased in this life and in a special manner to draw nigh to any of them, they quickly see that their hearts cannot endure, nor can their hands be strong. Ezekiel 22.14 Their hands hang down and their stout hearts tremble like an aspen leaf. He who first sinned was a striking instance of what we have affirmed. He heard the voice of God, Genesis 3.8. So he had done before without the least trouble of consternation. He was made for communion with God, and that he might hear his voice was part of his blessedness. But now, he says, I heard thy voice and was afraid and hid myself. He knew that God was coming on the inquest of sin, and he was not able to bear the thoughts of meeting him. 
Could he have gone into the bowels of the earth from whence he was taken, and have been there hid from God, he would have done it. Things are now altered with him, in that God, whom he loved before, is a good, holy, powerful, righteous creator, preserver, benefactor, and rewarder. He now sees only wrath, indignation, vengeance, and terror. This draws from him those dreadful words, I heard thy voice and was afraid and hid myself. The giving of the law evinces what effects the consideration of God's proceeding with sinners according to the tenor of it must produce. All the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the voice of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. Exodus twenty eighteen and 19 and Hebrews twelve eighteen. In this manner came forth from the Lord that fiery law, Deuteronomy 33, 2, so that all who were concerned in it did exceedingly quake and tremble. And yet all of this respects, but the severity of the law in general, without the application of it to any soul in particular, there is a solemnity that carries an awe with it in the preparation of an ass's eh, to be kept and held by poor worms like ourselves. But the dread of it is peculiar to the malefactors, for whose trial and execution the preparation is made. When a soul comes to think that all this dreadful preparation, this appearance of terrible majesty, these dreams of the fiery law, are pointed towards him, it will make him cry out, Lord, who can stand? And this law is still in force towards sinners, even as it was on the day wherein it was given on Mount Sinai. Though Moses grew old, yet his strength never failed. Nor has a law given by him lost anything of strength, power, or authority towards sinners. It is still accompanied with thunderings and lightnings as of old. And it will not fail to represent the terror of the Lord to a guilty soul. Among the saints themselves I could produce instances to show that they have found it to be thus. The cases of Job and David are known. I shall only consider it in Christ himself. From himself he had no occasion of any discouraging thought, being wholly harmless, undefiled. He fulfilled all righteousness, did his Father's will in all things, and abode in his love. This must be attended with the highest peace and most blessed joy. In the very entrance on his trials he had a full persuasion of a comfortable issue and success, as we may see, Isaiah 50, 7 and 8. But yet when his soul was exercised with thoughts of God's marking our iniquities upon him, it was sorrowful unto death. He was amazed and very heavy. His agony, his bloody sweat, his strong cries and supplications, his reiterated prayers, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, his last and dreadful cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? All manifest what apprehensions he had of what it was for God to mark iniquities. Well may poor sinners cry out, Lord, who shall stand, when the Son of God himself so trembled under the weight of it. In serious thoughts of God mark his sin, he is represented to the soul under all these glorious, terrible attributes and excellences, which beget dread and terror in the hearts of sinners when they have no relief from any covenant engagements in Christ. The soul looks upon him as a great lawgiver, James 4.12, able to revenge the breach of it by destroying body and soul in hell. As one terrible in holiness, of pure eyes, and to behold iniquity, the living God into whose hands it is a fearful thing to fall, as attended with vindictive justice, saying, Vengeance is mine, I will recompense. Hebrews 10.30 Now for a soul to consider God closed with all those dreadful and terrible excellences, coming to deal with sinners according to the tenor of his fiery law, cannot but make him cry out with Moses, I exceedingly fear and quake. These things work in their minds a conclusion that God's mark and sin according to the tenor of the law and man's salvation are utterly inconsistent, a conclusion that must shake a soul when pressed under the sense of its own guilt. When a person who is really guilty and knows himself to be guilty is brought to his trial, he has but these four grounds of hope that his safety in his trial may be consistent. He may think that either one... The judge will not be able to discover his crimes, or two, that someone will powerfully intercede for him with the judge, or three, that the rule of the law is not so strict as to notice his errors, or number four, that the penalty is not so severe, but there may be a way of escape. Cut him short of his expectations from some one or all of these, and all his hopes must of necessity perish. Number one, of the judge, we have spoken somewhat already. 
The present inquiry is whether anything may be hid from him, and so a door of escape be opened to a sinner. The apostle tells us that all things are naked and opened unto him, Hebrews 4.13. And the psalmist, that there is not a thought in our hearts, nor a word in our tongue, but he understandeth it afar off, and knoweth it altogether, Psalm 139, 2 and 4. What the sinner knows of himself which may cause him to fear that God knows, and what he knows not of himself that deserves his fear, that God knows also. He is greater than our hearts, and knoweth all things, 1 John 3.20. When God shall not only set in order before the sinner the secret sins which he retains some remembrance of, but also bring to mind that world of abominations of which either he never took any notice or hath utterly forgotten, it will trouble, yea, confound him. Number two. But may not this judge be entreated to pass by what he knows and deal favorably with the sinner? May not an intercessor be obtained to plead in behalf of the guilty soul? Eli determines this matter, 1 Samuel 2.25. If any one man sin against another, the judges shall entreat for him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? There is not, saith Joe, between us one that might argue the case and pleaded for me, and so make up the matter, laying his hand upon us both. Job 9.33 We now consider a sinner purely under the administration of the law, which knows nothing of a mediator. In that case, who shall take upon him to intercede for the sinner? Besides that, all creatures in heaven and earth are engaged in the contest of God against sinners. And besides the greatness and terror of his majesty, that will certainly deter all or any of them from undertaking any such work, what is the request that, in this case, must be put up to God? Is it not that he would cease to be holy, cease to be righteous, relinquish his throne, deny himself in sovereignty, and escape his justice? Is this request reasonable? Is he fit to intercede for sinners that would make it? Would he not by so doing prove himself to be the greatest of them? The sinner cannot then expect any door of escape to be opened to him. All the world is against him, and the case must be tried out nakedly between God and him. But, number three, it may be the rule of the law whereby the sinner is to be tried is not so strict, but that in the case of such sins as he is guilty of, it may admit of a favorable interpretation, or that the good he has done may be laid in the balance against his evil, and so some relief be obtained. But the matter is quite otherwise. There is no good action of a sinner, though it were perfectly good, that can lie in the balance with or compensate the evil of the least sin committed. For all good is due on another account though no guilt were incurred. It's a payment of money that a man has borrowed makes no satisfaction for what he has stolen. No more will our duties compensate for our sins. Nor is there any good action of a sinner but it has evil and guilt enough attending it to render itself unacceptable. So that men may well cease from thoughts of supererogation or doing more than duty requires. Besides, where there is any one sin, if all the good in the world might be supposed to be in the same person, yet in the indispensable order of our dependence on God, nothing of that good could come into consideration, till the guilt of that sin were answered for to the utmost. The penalty of every sin be in the eternal ruin of the sinner, all his supposed good can avail him nothing. And for the law itself, it is an issue of the holiness and righteousness and wisdom of God, so that there is not any evil, great or small, but is forbidden and condemned by it. Enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. Psalm 143.2 That is, if things are to be tried and determined by the law, no sinner can be acquitted. Romans 3.20, Galatians 2.16 But yet, number four, it may be, the sentence of the law is not so fierce and dreadful, but that though guilt be found, there may be yet a way of escape. But the law speaks not one word on this side, death to an offender. There is a greatness and an eternity of wrath in the sentence of it, and it is God himself who has undertaken to see the vengeance of it executed, so that on all these accounts the conclusion mentioned must be fixed in the soul of a sinner that entertains thoughts of drawn nigh to God. 
Though what has been spoken may be of general use to sinners of all classes, whether called home to God, or yet strangers to Him, yet I shall not insist upon any general improvement of it, because it is intended only for one special end or purpose. What is aimed at is to show that in the first thoughts that arise in the heart of a poor and tangled soul, when he begins to endeavor a return to God, the law immediately puts in its claim against him. God is represented to him as angry, and his terror besets him round about. This fills him with fear and confusion, so that he knows not what to do. These troubles are greater or less according as God sees it best for the poor creature's present humiliation and future safety. What then does the sinner? What are his thoughts on this subject? Does he think to fly from God and to give over all endeavors of recovery? Does he say, This God is a holy and terrible God, I cannot serve him? It is to no purpose for me to look for anything but fury and destruction from him, and therefore I may as well give over as persist in my design of drawing nigh to him? It cannot be denied that thoughts of this nature will be suggested by unbelief, and sometimes great perplexities arise to the soul. But this is not the issue and final product of this exercise of the soul. It produces another effect. It calls for that which is the first particular working of a great gracious soul, arising out of its sin entanglements, namely, number one, a sincere sense of sin, and number two, the acknowledgement of it, with three, self-condemnation and the justification of God. Number one, a sincere sense of sin. There is a twofold sense of sin, the one general and intellectual, in which a man knows what sin is, that he is a sinner, that he is guilty of this or that, these or those sins, but his heart is not affected proportionally to his knowledge. The other is active and efficacious, in which the soul being acquainted with the nature of sin and its own guilt is influenced by that apprehension to suitable affections and acts. Of both these we have an instance in the same person. David, before Nathan's coming to him, had the former. Afterwards he had the latter also. It cannot be imagined but that, before the coming of the prophet, he had a general knowledge of the nature of sin, and that he was a sinner, and guilty of those very sins for which afterwards he was reproved. But yet this wrought not in him any one affection suitable to his condition, and the same may be said of most sinners in the world. But now when Nathan comes to him and gives him the latter efficacious sense of which we speak, we know what effects it produced. It is the latter only that is under consideration, a deep and practical apprehension wrought in the mind and heart by the Holy Ghost of sin and of its evils, in reference to the law and love of God, the cross and blood of Christ, the communion and consolation of the Spirit, and all the fruits of love, mercy, or grace that it has been made partaker of, or on gospel grounds has hoped for. First, the principal efficient cause of it is the Holy Ghost. He it is who convinceth of sin. John 16.8 he works indeed by means. He wrought it in David by the ministry of Nathan, and he wrought it in Peter by the luck of Christ. But his work it is. No man can work it upon his own soul. It will not spring out of men's rational considerations. Though men may exercise their thoughts about such things as one would think were enough to break the hearts of stone, yet if the Holy Ghost put not forth a peculiar efficacy of his own, this sense of sin will not be produced." As the waters at the pool of Bethesda were not troubled, but when an angel descended and moved them, no more will the heart be for sin without a saving entrance of the Holy Ghost. Number two, it is a deep apprehension of sin and the evils of it. Slight transient thoughts amount not to the sense of which we speak. My sorrow, saith David, is continually before me. Psalm thirty-eight seventeen. It pressed him always and greatly. Hence he compares this sense of sin wrought by the Holy Ghost to arrows that stick in the flesh, verse 2. They pain sorely and are always perplexing. Sin in this sense of it lays hold on the soul so that the sinner cannot look up, and it abides with them, making his sore run in the night without ceasing and deprives the soul of rest. My soul, he says, refused to be comforted. This apprehension of sin lies down and rises with him. Number three, it is practical. 
It is not seated merely in the speculative part of the mind, hovering in general notions, but it dwells in the practical understanding which effectually influences the will and affections. Such an apprehension, this sorrow and humiliation are inseparable from it. Number four, it has respect to the law of God. There can be no due consideration of sin in which the law has not its place. The more a man sees of the excellency of the law, the more he sees of the vileness of sin. This is true of a soul in its first endeavor for a recovery from the entanglements of sin. He labors thoroughly to know his disease that he may be cured. It will do him no good, he knows, to be ignorant of his disease or his danger. He knows that if his wounds be not searched to the bottom, they will fester and destroy him. To the law then he brings himself and his sin, and by it he learns its vileness and danger. Most men lie in their depths because they wish to avoid the first step of their rising. From the bottom of their misery they would fain at once be at the top of their felicity. The soul led in this work by the Holy Ghost does not so. He converses with the law, brings his sins to it, and fully hears its sentence. As ever you desire to come to rest, avoid not this entrance of your passage unto it. Weigh well what the law speaks of your sin and its desert, or you will never make a due application to God for forgiveness. As ever you would have your souls justified by grace, take care to have your sins judged by the law. Number 5. There is in the sense of sin a respect to the love of God, and this breaks the heart of the poor returning sinner. Sorrow from the loss shuts itself up in the soul and strangles it. Sorrow from thoughts of the love of God opens it and causes it to flow forth. Thoughts of sinning against the love of God managed by the Holy Ghost, what shall I say? Their effects in the heart are not to be expressed. This made Ezra cry out, O oh my God, I blush and am ashamed to lift up my face to thee. What shall we say after this? After what? Why, all the fruits of love and kindness that have been made partakers of. Thoughts of love and sin laid together make the soul blush, mourn, and be ashamed and confounded in itself. So Ezekiel thirty six thirty one. Then shall you remember your own evil ways and your doings that were not good. When shall they do so? When thoughts and apprehensions of love shall be brought home to them. Then shall you loathe yourselves in your own sight. The soul now calls to mind what love, what kindness, what mercy. What grace, what patience has been exercised towards it. The thoughts of all these now come in upon him as streams of water. Such mercy, such communion, such privileges, such hopes of glory, such tastes of heaven, such peace, such consolation, such joy, such communications of the Spirit, all to a poor, wretched, cursed, lost, forlorn sinner, and all this despised, neglected, the God of them all provoked, forsaken. Ah, saith the soul, whither shall I cause my sorrow to go? This fills him with shame and confusion of face, makes him mourn in secret and sigh to the breaking of the loins. Number six, the blood and cross of Christ is also brought to remembrance by the Holy Ghost. Ah, saith the soul, have I thus requited the wonderful love of my Redeemer? Is this the return, the requital I have made to him? Are not heaven and earth astonished at the despising of such love? This broke Peter's heart on the look of Christ. Such words as these from Christ will in this condition sound in the ears of the soul. Did I love thee and leave my glory to become a scorn and reproach for thy sake? Did I think my life and all that was dear to me too good for thee to save thee from the wrath to come? Have I been a wilderness unto thee or a land of darkness? What could I have done more for thee? When I had nothing left but my life, it went for thee, that thou mightest live by my death, be washed in my blood, and be saved through my soul's being made an offering for thee. And hast thou requited my love to prefer a lust before me, the world before me, or by mere sloth and folly to be turned away from me? Go, unkind, unthankful soul, and see if thou canst find another Redeemer. 
This overwhelms the soul and even drowns it in tears and sorrow. And when the bitterness of the sufferings of Christ are brought to mind, they look on him whom they have pierced and mourn. Zechariah 12.10 They remember his gall and wormwood, his cries and tears, his agony and sweat, his desertion and anguish, his blood and death. The sharpness of the sword that was in his soul and the bitterness of the cup that was put into his hand. Such a soul now looks on Christ, bleeding, dying, wrestling with wrath and curse for him, and sees his sins and the streams of blood that issued from his side, and all this increases the sense of sin in which we speak. Number seven, it relates to the communion and consolations of the Holy Ghost with all the privileges and fruits of love we are by him made partakers of. The Spirit is given to believers on the promise of Christ to dwell in them. He takes up their hearts to be his dwelling place. To what ends and purposes? That he may purify and sanctify them, make them holy and dedicate them to God, furnish them with graces and gifts, interest them in privileges, guide, direct, comfort them, and seal them unto the day of redemption. Now the Spirit is grieved by sin, Ephesians 4.30, and his dwelling place defiled thereby, 1 Corinthians 6.19 and 3.17. Thoughts of this greatly sharpen the spiritual sense of sin in the recovering soul. He considers what light, what love, what joy, what consolation, what privileges he has been made partaker of, what warnings to keep him from sin he has received from the Spirit and says within himself, What have I done? Whom have I grieved? Whom have I provoked? What if the Lord should now, for my folly and ingratitude, utterly take his Holy Spirit from me? What if I should have so grieved him that he will dwell in me no more, delight in me no more? What dismal darkness, yea, what utter ruin should I be left to? And what shame and confusion of face belong to me for my wretched ingratitude towards him? This is the first thing that appears in the returning soul, a sincere sense of sin wrought in it by the Holy Ghost. And this a soul in the depths described must come to if ever it expects deliverance. Let not such persons expect to have a renewed sense of mercy without a revived sense of sin. Section 2. Hence proceeds an ingenuous, free, gracious acknowledgement of sin. Men may have a sense of sin, and yet suffer it to lie burning as a fire shut up in their bones, to their continual disquietude, without coming to a free, soul-opening acknowledgement. Yea, confession may be made in general, with the mention of that very sin in which the soul is most entangled, and yet the soul comes short of a due performance of this duty. Consider how the case stood with David. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. Psalm 32, 3. How could David keep silence and yet roar all the day long? What is that silence which is consistent with roaring? It is a mere negation of the duty expressed, verse 5, that is intended. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and my iniquities I have not hid. It was not a silence of submission and waiting on God. That, that would not have produced a wasting of a spiritual strength, as he complains as silence did. Nor yet was it a sullen, stubborn, contumacious spirit. He implies, as Calvin well says, an affection between patience and stubbornness, bordering on the one and the other. That is, he had a deep sense of sin. This disquieted him and perplexed him all the day long, which he calls his roaring, it weakened and wearied him, making his bones wax old or his strength decay. Yet was he not able to bring his heart to that ingenuous, gracious acknowledgement which, like the opening of a festered wound, would have given at least some ease to his soul. God's children are often in this manner like ours, though they are convinced of a fault and are really troubled at the thought of it, yet they will hardly acknowledge it. So do God's people. They will go up and down, sigh and mourn. But an evil and untoward frame of spirit under the power of unbelief and fear keeps them from this duty. Now that this acknowledgement may be acceptable to God, it is required that it be free and that it be full. Number one, it must be free and spiritually ingenuous. Cain, Pharaoh, Ahab, Judas came all to an acknowledgement of sin, but it was whether they would or not. It was pressed out of them. It did not willingly flow from them. 
The confession of a person under the convincing terrors of the law or dread of threatening judgments is like that of malefactors on the rack who speak out that for which they and their friends must die. What they say, though it be truth, is the fruit of force and torture, not of any ingenuousness of mind. So is it with merely convinced persons. They come not to the acknowledgment of sin with any more freedom, and the reason is because all sin has shame. And for men to be free to shame is naturally impossible, shame being nature shrinking from itself. But now the returning soul has never more freedom, liberty, and aptitude of spirit than when he is in the acknowledgment of those things whereof he is most ashamed. And this is no small evidence that it proceeds from the spirit which is attended with liberty. For where the spirit of God is, there is liberty. 2 Corinthians 3.17 when David was delivered from his silence, he expresses his spirit in the performance of this duty. I acknowledge my sin, and mine iniquity I have not hid. I said, I will confess my transgression. Psalm 32, 5. His mouth is now open, and his heart enlarged, and he multiplies one expression upon another to manifest his enlargement. So doth a soul rising out of its depths in the beginning of this address to God having the true sense of sin wrought in him by the Holy Ghost. His heart is made free and enlarged upon an ingenuous acknowledgment of his sin before the Lord. He pours out his soul into God, and has not more freedom in anything than in confessing that of which he is most ashamed. Self-Condemnation this acknowledgment must also be full, reserves a ruin conversion. If the soul have any secret thought of rolling a sweet morsel under his tongue, as bowing in the house of Rimon, it is like part of the price kept back which makes a whole a robbery instead of an offering. If there be remaining a bitter root of favoring any one lust or sin, or any occasion of or temptation to sin, let a man be as open, free, and earnest as can be imagined in the acknowledgment of all other sins, the whole duty is rendered abominable. Some persons, when they are brought into depths and anguish about any sin, and are forced to the acknowledgment of it, are at the same time little concerned for their other follies and iniquities, which it may be are no less provoking to God. Let not such a one think that he shall receive anything from God. It must be full and comprehensive as well as free and ingenuous. Of such importance is the right performance of this duty that the promise of pardon is often peculiarly annexed to it, is that which certainly carries along with it the other duties which make up a full returning unto God. Proverbs 28.13 1 John 1, nine, Job 33.27-28 Section 3. There yet remains self-condemnation with the justification of God, which lies expressly in the words of the verse under consideration. And in this are two parts. Number 1. Self-abhorrence or dislike. The soul is now wholly displeased with itself and reflects upon itself with regret and trouble. So the Apostle declares it to have been with the Corinthians when their godly sorrow was working in them. 2 Corinthians 7.11 Among other things, it wrought in them indignation and revenge, or a reflection on themselves with all manner of dislike and abhorrence. In the winding up of the controversy between God and Job, this is a point he rests in. As he had come in general to a free, full, ingenuous acknowledgment of sin, chapter 44 and 5, so in particular he gives up his whole contest in this abhorrence of himself. I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. What a vile, wretched creature have I been, saith the soul. I blush and am ashamed to think of my folly, baseness, and ingratitude. Is it possible that I should deal thus with the Lord? I abhor, I loathe myself. I would fly anywhere from myself. I am so vile. A thing to be despised of God, angels, and men. Number two, there is self-judging in it also. This the apostle invites the Corinthians to. 
If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. 1 Corinthians 11.31 This is a person pronouncing sentence on himself according to the tenor of the law. The soul brings not only its sin, but itself also to the law. It puts itself as to merit and desert under the stroke and severity of it. Hence arises a full justification of God, in what sentence soever he shall be pleased to pronounce in the case before him. The three things to which attention has now been called show the state and first actings of a gracious soul rising from its depths. They are all of them signally expressed in Hosea 14, 1-4, where we have a signal recovery exemplified. And this makes way for the exaltation of grace, the great thing in all this, the dispensation aimed at by God, Ephesians 1, 6. That which he is now doing is to bring the soul to glory in him, which is all the return he hath from his large and infinitely bountiful expense of grace and mercy. Now nothing can render grace conspicuous and glorious until the soul come to this. Grace will not be high until the soul be laid very low. And this also prepares the soul for receiving mercy and a sense of pardon, the great thing named at on the one part of the sinner, and it prepares it for every incumbent duty. This brings the soul to wait on God with diligence and patience. If things presently answer not our expectation, we are ready to think we have done what we can. If it will be no better, we must bear it as we are able, which spirit God abhors. The soul in the state waits the pleasure of God, as we shall see in the close of the psalm. Oh, says such a one, if ever I obtain a sense of love, if ever I enjoy one smile of his countenance more, it is unspeakable grace. It is good for me quietly to wait and hope for his salvation, and it drives the soul to prayer. Yea, a soul always in this frame prays always. And there is nothing more evident than that the want of a thorough engagement in the performance of these duties is a great cause why so few come off clear from their entanglements all their days. Men heal their wounds slightly, and therefore, after a new painful festering, they are brought into the same condition of restlessness and trouble which they were in before. But the soul is not to be left in the state just described. There is other work for it, if it intend to come to rest and peace. It has obtained an imminent advantage for the discovery of forgiveness and a just sense of sin, the acknowledgment of it and self-condemnation. But there are two evils which often attend men when they are brought into this state. Some rest in it and press no further. Some rest upon it and suppose that it is all which is required of them. First, by resting or staying in it, I mean the soul's desponding, through discouraging thoughts that deliverance is not to be obtained. Being made sensible of sin, it is so overwhelmed with thoughts of its own vileness and unworthiness as to sink under the burden. Such a soul is afflicted and tossed with tempests and not comforted. As in the storm at sea, when all means of contending are gone, men give up themselves to be driven and tossed by the wind and seas at their pleasure. This brought Israel to cry out, My way is hid from the Lord, and my judgment is passed over from my God. Isaiah 40:27. And Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Chapter 49:14. The soul begins secretly to think there is no hope. God regardeth it not. It shall one day perish. Relief is far away, and trouble nigh at hand. These thoughts so oppress them, that though they forsake not God utterly to their own destruction, yet they draw not nigh to him effectually to their consolation. This is the first evil that the soul in this condition is unable to avoid. We know how God rebukes it in Zion. Zion said, The Lord hath forsaken me, and my Lord hath forgotten me. Isaiah 49:14. But how foolish is Zion! How forward! How unbelieving in this manner! What ground has she for such sinful despondency, such discouraging conclusions? Can a woman, saith the Lord, forget her sucking child, that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but I will not forget thee. Such a reproof he gives to Jacob upon a similar complaint, chapter 40, 28 through 30. There is nothing more provoking to the Lord or more disadvantaged to the soul than such sinful despondency. 
It insensibly weakens the soul and disables it both for present and future endeavors. Hence, some poor creatures mourn and even pine away in this condition, never getting one step beyond a perplexing sense of sin all their days. Some have dwelt so long upon it and have so entangled themselves with a multitude of perplexing thoughts that at length their natural faculties have been weakened and rendered utterly useless so that they have lost sense of sin and everything else. Against some, Satan has taken advantage to cast so many entangling objections into their minds that their whole time has been taken up in proposing doubts and objections against themselves. With these, they have gone up and down to one another, and being never able to come to a consistency in their own thoughts, have spent all their days in a fruitless, withering, comfortless condition. Some with whom things come to a better issue are yet for a season brought to such discomposure of spirit, or are so filled with their own apprehensions, that when things which are most proper to their condition are spoken to them, they make no impression upon them. Thus a soul is weakened by dwelling too long on these considerations, until they cry with those in Ezekiel 33.10, Our sins are upon us, we pine away in them, and how shall we then live? This state of mind will insensibly give countenance to hard thoughts of God, and so to repining and weariness and waiting on Him. At first the soul neither apprehends nor fears any such issue. It supposes it shall condemn and abhor itself and justify God, and that forever. But when relief doesn't come, this resolution begins to weaken. Secret thoughts arise in the heart that God is inexorable, and it sometimes utters such complaints as will bring the soul into new depth before it has issue of its trials. Here in humiliation, preceding conversion, many convinced persons perish. They cannot wait God's season and perish under their impatience. Of what the saints of God themselves have been overtaken with in their depths and trials, we have many examples. Delight and expectation are the grounds of our abiding with God. Both these are weakened by a conquering, prevailing sense of sin, without some relief from the discovery of forgiveness though at a distance, and therefore our perplexed soul stays not here, but presses on towards that discovery. Secondly, there is a resting on the sense of sin that is noxious and hurtful. Some finding it, with other things that attend it, wrought in them in some measure, begin to think that now all is well. This is all that is required. They will endeavor to make a life of comfort from such arguments as they can raise from their trouble. They think this is the ground of peace, that they have not peace. Here's some rest before conversion, and it proves their ruin. Because they are convinced of sin and trouble about it and burdened with it, they think it shall be well with them. But were not Cain, Esau, Saul, Ahab, Judas convinced of sin and burdened with it? Did this profit them? Did it interest them in the promises? Did not the wrath of God overtake them notwithstanding? So it is with many daily. They think their conviction is conversion and that their sins are pardoned because they have been troubled. But this is really a fruit of self-righteousness. For a soul to place the spring of its peace or comfort in anything of its own is to fall short of Christ. We must not only be justified, but glory in him also. Isaiah 45:25. Men make use of the evidence of their graces, but only as means to a further end. Not as a rest of the soul in the least. For this deprives men's very humiliation of all gospel humility. True humility consists more in believing than in being sensible of sin. In believing the soul truly empties and abases itself. A sense of sin may consist with an obstinate resolution to scramble for something on the account of self-endeavors. Though an evangelical sense of sin be a grace, yet it is not the uniting grace which interests us in Christ. It is not that which peculiarly and in its own nature exalts Him. There is in the sense of sin that which is natural and that which is spiritual. The former consists in sorrow, trouble, self-abasement, dejection, anxiety of mind. Of these, I may say, as the apostle of afflictions, they are not joyous but grievous. In their own nature, they are no more than the soul's retreat into itself with an abhorrence of the objects of its sorrow and grief. To stop here is to sit down short of Christ, whether it be for life or consolation. Let there be no mistake. There can be no evangelical sense of sin and humiliation where there is no union with Christ.
Zechariah 12.10. The sense of sin in itself and in its own nature is not availing. Christ is the only rest of our souls. In anything, for any end or purpose to take up short of him is to lose it. It is not enough that we be prisoners of hope, but we must turn to our stronghold. Zechariah 9.12. Not enough that we are weary and laden, but we must come to him. Matthew 11.28-29. It will not suffice that we are weak and know that we are weak, but we must take hold on the strength of God, Isaiah 27, 5. Indeed, pressing after forgiveness is the very life and power of evangelical humiliation. How shall a man know that his humiliation is evangelical, that his sorrow is according to God? He does not do as Cain did, who cried his sins were greater than he could bear, and so departed from the presence of God. Nor as Judas did, who repented and hanged himself. Nor as Felix did tremble for a while, and then returned to his lusts. Nor as the Jews did in the prophet pine away under their iniquities because of vexation of heart. Nor doth he divert his thoughts to other things thereby to relieve his soul in his trouble. Nor fix upon a righteousness of his own. Nor slothfully lie down under his perplexity. But in the midst of it he applies himself to God in Christ for pardon and mercy. And it is the soul's application unto God for forgiveness, and not its sense of sin that gives to God the glory of His grace. Chapter 4 Discovery of Forgiveness But there is forgiveness with thee, that thou mayest be feared. Verse 4 Forgiveness is from a Hebrew word signifying to spare, to pardon, to be propitious, in opposition to a similar word meaning to cut off and destroy. Jerome, with the Septuagint, renders it propitiation, which implies more than pardon. The word is constantly applied to sin, and expresses everything that concurs to its pardon or remission. It implies the mind and will of pardoning, or God's gracious readiness to forgive. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive, that is, benign and meek, or sparing and propitious, it also regards the act of pardoning or actual forgiveness itself. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities actually discharges thee of them. This is a word God uses in the covenant in that great promise of grace and pardon. Jeremiah 31, 34 It is warrantable for us, yea, necessary, to take the word in the utmost extent of its signification and use. It is a word of favor, and requires an interpretation tending towards the enlargement of it. We see it may be rendered propitiation or grace, and also pardon, and may denote these three things. The gracious, tender, merciful heart and will of God, who is a God of pardons and forgiveness. A respect unto Jesus Christ, the only propitiation for sin, as he is expressly called in Romans 3.25, 1 John 2.2, 2, mediating between the gracious heart of God and the actual pardon of sinners. All forgiveness is founded on propitiation. It also denotes condonation, or forgiveness, as we are made partakers of it comprising it both actively, as it is an act of grace in God, and passively is terminated in our souls with the deliverance that attends it. In this sense, as it looks downwards and in its effects respects us, it is of mere grace, and as it looks upwards to its causes and respects the Lord Christ, it is from propitiation or atonement, as this is that part in which is administered in the covenant of grace. The import of these words in their connection in this psalm and their relation to the state of the soul here mentioned seems to be this. Although, O Lord, no man can approach unto thee or stand before thee, if thou shouldest mark his sins and follies according to the tenor of the law, nor could he serve so great and holy a God, yet because I know from thy revelation of it that there is also with thee, on account of Jesus Christ, the propitiation, pardon, and forgiveness, I am encouraged to continue with thee, waiting on thee, worshiping thee, when without this discovery I should rather choose to have rocks and mountains fall upon me to hide me from thy presence. But there is forgiveness with thee, and therefore thou shalt be feared. From the words thus unfolded, the ensuing propositions arise. 
Faith, the discovery of forgiveness in God, though it have no present sense of its own peculiar interest therein, is a great support of a sin-perplexed soul. Gospel forgiveness, the discovery of which is the sole support of sin-distressed souls, relates to the gracious heart or good will of the Father, the God of forgiveness, the propitiation made by the blood of the Son, and free pardon according to the covenant of grace. Faith, the discovery of forgiveness in God, is the sole foundation of adherence to Him and acceptable worship and reverential obedience. My immediate aim is to confirm and illustrate the first of these propositions. I therefore proceed to show that there is not the least encouragement to a sinner to deal with God without this discovery of forgiveness in Him, that this discovery is a matter great, holy, and mysterious, and which few on gospel-abiding grounds attain to that yet this is a great sacred and infallible truth, and that it is a stable support to a sin-distressed soul. There is not the least encouragement for a sinner's approaching God without this discovery. All else is covered with a deluge of wrath. This is the only ark where the soul may repair and find rest. All without it is darkness, curse, and terror. We have an instance of it in Adam. When he knew himself to be a sinner and it was impossible for him to discover forgiveness with God, he laid aside all thoughts of treating with him, that the best of his foolish contrivance was for an escape. I heard thy voice in the garden and was afraid, because I was naked and I hid myself. Genesis 3.10 Nothing but thou shalt die the death sounded in his ears. In the morning of that day he had converse and communion with God, with boldness and peace. Why then does nothing but fear, flying, hiding now possess him? Adam had sinned. The promise was not yet given. No revelation was made of forgiveness in God. And what other course than that vain and foolish one to fix upon he knew not? No more can any of his posterity without this revelation. Whatever has been the resort of anyone, it has been no less foolish than his hiding, and in most more pernicious. When Cain had received his sentence from God, it is said he went out from the presence of the Lord, Genesis 4.16. From his providential presence he could never withdraw himself, so the psalmist informs us at large, Psalm 139.7-9. The very heathen knew, by the light of nature, that guilt could never drive men out of the reach of God. They knew that the vengeance of God would not spare sinners, nor could it be avoided. Acts 28.4 From God's gracious presence, which Cain never enjoyed, he could not depart. It was then God's presence as to his worship and all outward acts of communion that he forsook and departed from. He had no discovery by faith of forgiveness, and therefore resolved to have no more to do with God or those who cleave to him. The sinners of Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? Isaiah 33:14. The persons spoken of are sinners, great sinners and hypocrites. Conviction of sin and the desert of sin was fallen upon them. A light to discern forgiveness they had not. They apprehend God only as a devouring fire and everlasting burnings, ones that would not spare but would assuredly inflict punishment according to the desert of sin, and hence there was no abiding, no enduring his presence. The condition into which this consideration brings the souls of sinners, when conviction grows strong upon them, the Holy Ghost declares, Micah 6, 6 and 7, Wherewith shall I come before the Lord, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, or with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Since the sin presses, forgiveness is not discovered, and how does a poor creature perplex itself in vain to find out a way of dealing with God? Will a sedulous, intelligent observation of his own ordinances and institutions relieve me? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Alas, thou art a sinner, and these sacrifices cannot make thee perfect or acquit thee. Hebrews 10.1 Shall I do more than ever he required of any of the sons of men? Oh, that I have 
thousands of rams and ten thousands of rivers of oil to offer him. Alas, if thou hast all the bulls and goats in the world, it is not possible that their blood should take away sin. Verse 4. But I have heard of them who have snatched away their own children from their mother's breasts and cast them into the fire until they were consumed, so to pacify their conscience and expiating the guilt of their iniquities. Shall I take this course? Will it relieve me? Am I ready to part with my firstborn into the fire so that I may have deliverance from my transgressions? Alas, to accept of such offerings never entered the heart of God. And so is it still as to any duties man can perform. Where there is no discovery of forgiveness, they will yield a soul no relief, no support. God is not to be treated with upon such terms. Hence, the discovery of forgiveness in God is great, holy, and mysterious, and which very few on gospel grounds attain to. All men indeed say there is forgiveness, and most men are persuaded that they think so. Only men in great and desperate extremities like Cain or Spira seem to call it into question. But their thoughts are empty, yea, for the most part wicked and atheistical. They think that God is altogether such an one as themselves, that indeed he takes little or no care about sin, but passes it over as lightly as they do. In the progress of this work, I shall show that, notwithstanding all their pretenses, the most of men never had, indeed, any real discovery of forgiveness, and point out the difference between their vain credulity and a gracious gospel discovery of forgiveness in God. This discovery includes both the revelation of it made by God and our understanding and reception of that revelation to our own advantage. The grounds of the difficulty of making this discovery consist partly in the hindrances that lie in the way of it, and partly in the nature of the thing discovered, of both which I shall briefly treat. Number one. The constant voice of conscience lies against the discovery of forgiveness. Conscience, if not seared, inexorably condemns and pronounces wrath on the soul that has the least guilt cleaving to it. It lies close to the soul, and by importunity and loud speaking, it will be heard. It will make the whole soul attend, or it will speak like thunder. And its constant voice is that where there is guilt there must be judgment. Romans 2, 14 and 15. Conscience naturally knows nothing of forgiveness. Yea, it is against its very work and office to hear anything of it. If a man of courage and honesty be entrusted to keep a garrison against an enemy, let one come and tell him that peace is made between those whom he serves and their enemies, so that he may leave his guard, and set open the gates, and cease his watchfulness how wary will he be, lest under this pretense he be betrayed? No, he says, I will keep my post until I have express orders from my superiors. Conscience is entrusted with the power of God in the soul of a sinner, with command to keep all in subjection, with reference to the judgment to come. It will not betray its trust in believing every report of peace. No, it says and speaks in the name of God. Guilt and punishment are inseparable. If the soul sin, God will judge. What tell you me of forgiveness? I know what my commission is, and that I will abide by. You shall not bring a superior commander into my trust. Now whom should a man believe if not his own conscience, which... As it will not flatter him, so it intends not to affright him, but to speak the truth as a matter requires. Conscience has two works in reference to sin, one to condemn the acts of sin, another to judge the person of the sinner, both with reference to the judgment of God. When forgiveness comes, it would sever these offices and take one of them out of the hand of conscience. It will condemn the sin, but it shall no more condemn the sinner. He shall be freed from its sentence. Here conscience labors to keep its whole dominion and to keep the power of forgiveness from being enthroned in the soul. Nor indeed is it any easy work to deal with. The Apostle tells us that all the sacrifices of the law could not do it, Hebrews 10.2. They could not bring a man into that state in which he should have no more conscience of sin, that is, conscience condemning the person. For conscience in causing a sense of sin and the condemnation of it is never to be taken away. And this can be no otherwise done but by the blood of Christ, as the Apostle at large there declares. It is no easy thing, then, to make a discovery of forgiveness to a soul when conscience lies in opposition to it. Hence is the soul's great desire to establish its own righteousness, in which its natural principles may be preserved in their power.
Let self-righteousness be enthroned and natural conscience desires no more. It is satisfied and pacified. The law it knows, but as for forgiveness it says, whence is it? Unto the utmost, until Christ perfects his conquest, there are on this account secret strugglings in the heart against free pardon in the gospel, and fluctuations of mind about it. Yea, hence are the doubts and fears of believers themselves. They are nothing but the strivings of conscience to keep its whole dominion, to condemn the sinner as well as the sin. More or less, it keeps up its pretensions against the gospel whilst we live in this world. It is a great work that the blood of Christ has to do upon the conscience of a sinner. For whereas it hath a power and claims a right to condemn both sin and sinner, the one part of this power is to be cleared, strengthened, made more active, vigorous, and watchful, the other to be taken quite away. It shall now see more sins than formerly, more of the vileness of all sins than formerly, and condemn them with more abhorrence than ever, upon more and more glorious accounts than formerly. But it is also made to see an interposition between these sins and the person of the sinner who has committed them, which is no small or ordinary work. Number two. The law lies against this discovery of forgiveness. The law is a beam of the holiness of God himself. What it speaks to us, it speaks in the name and authority of God. It is certain that the law knows neither mercy nor forgiveness. Its very sanction lies wholly against forgiveness. The soul that sinneth shall die. Cursed is he that continueth not in all things written in the book of the law to do them. Ezekiel 18.4 Deuteronomy 27.26 Hence the apostle pronounces universally, without exception, that they who are under the law are under the curse. Galatians 3.10 And he says in verse 12, The law is not of faith. There is an inconsistency between the law and believing. They cannot have their abode in power together. Do this and live, fail and die, is the constant immutable voice of the law. This it speaks in general to all, and this in particular to every one. And further, the sinner seems to have manifold and weighty reasons to attend to the voice of this law and to acquiesce in its sentence. For the law is co-natural to him, his domestic, his old acquaintance. It came into the world with him and has grown up with him from his infancy. It was implanted in his heart by nature. He can never shake it off or part with it. It is his familiar, his friend, that cleaves to him as a flesh to the bone. So that they who have not the law written cannot but show forth the work of the law. Romans 2, 14 and 15. And that because the law itself is inbred in them, and all the faculties of the soul are at peace with it, in subjection to it. It is a bond of their union, harmony, and correspondence among themselves and all their moral actings. It gives life, order, motion to them all. Now the gospel which comes to control this sentence of the law and to relieve the sinner from it is foreign to his nature, a strange thing to him, a thing he hath no acquaintance or familiarity with. It has not been bred up with him, nor is there any Anything in him to side with it, to make a party for it, or to plead in its behalf. Again, the law speaks nothing to a sinner but what his conscience assures him to be true. There is a constant concurrence in the testimony of the law and conscience. When the law says this or that is a sin worthy of death, conscience says it is even so. And where the law of itself, as being a general rule, rests, conscience helps it on and says of this and that sin worthy of death is the soul guilty. Then die, saith the law, as thou hast deserved. Now this must have a mighty efficacy to prevail with the soul to give credit to the testimony of the law. It speaks not one word but what he has a witness to within himself. These witnesses always agree, and so it seems to be established for a truth as that there is no forgiveness. The law also, though it speaks against the soul's interest, yet speaks nothing but what is so just, righteous, and equal, that it forces the soul's consent. So Paul tells us that men know this voice of the law to be the judgment of God, Romans 1, 32. They know it and cannot but consent to it, that it is the judgment of God, that it is good, righteous, equal, and indeed what can be more righteous than its sentence? It commands obedience to the God of life and death, promises a reward, and declares that for non-performance of duty, death will be inflicted. These terms are good, righteous, 
holy. The soul accepts them and knows not what it can desire better or more just. This the apostle insists upon, Romans seven twelve and 13. Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment holy and just and good. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. Wherever the blame falls, the soul cannot but acquit the law and confess that what it says is right. Now, though the authority and credit of a witness may go very far in a doubtful matter, when there is a concurrence of more witnesses, it strengthens the testimony. But nothing is so prevalent to beget belief as when the things spoken are themselves just and good, not liable to any reasonable exception. And so is it in this case, unto the authority of the law and concurrence of conscience is added the reasonableness and equity of the thing itself, even in the judgment of the sinner, namely, that every sin shall be punished and every transgression receive a meet recompense of reward. But yet further, what the law says, it speaks in the name and authority of God. What it says, then, must be believed, or we make God a liar. It comes not in its own name, but in the name of him who appointed it. You will say, then, is it so indeed? Is there no forgiveness with God? For this is a constant voice of the law, which you say speaks in the name and authority of God, and is therefore to be believed. I answer briefly with the Apostle, what the law speaks, it speaks to them that are under the law. It does not speak to them that are in Christ, whom the law of the Spirit of life has set free from the law of sin and death. But to them that are under the law, it speaks, and it speaks the very truth, and it speaks in the name of God, and its testimony is to be received. It says, There is no forgiveness in God to them that are under the law, and they that flatter themselves with a contrary persuasion will find themselves woe woefully mistaken at the great day. From these and similar considerations, I say, there seems a great deal of reason why the soul should conclude that it will be according to the testimony of the law, and that he shall not find forgiveness. Law and conscience close together, and insinuate themselves into the mind and judgment of a sinner. They strengthen the testimony of one another, and greatly prevail. If any are otherwise minded, I leave them to the trial." If ever God awakened their consciences to a thorough performance of their duty, if ever he opened their souls and let in the light and power of the law upon them, they will find it no small work to grapple with them. I am sure that generally they prevail so far that, in the preaching of the gospel, we have great cause to say, Lord, who hath believed our report? We come with our report of forgiveness, but who believes it? By whom is it received? Neither do the light or conscience or conversation of most men allow us to suppose it is embraced. The prevalent impressions of men concerning the nature and justice of God also lie against this discovery. There are in all men by nature indelible impressions of the holiness and purity of God, of his justice and hatred of sin, of his invariable righteousness in the government of the world. Their inward thought is that God is an avenger of sin, that it belongs to his government of the world, his holiness and righteousness, to take care that every sin be punished. All all men know, as already observed, Romans 1, 32, that it is a righteous thing with God to render tribulation to sinners. From thence is that fear which surprises men at an apprehension of the presence of God, or of anything that may seem to come on his errand. This notion of God's avenging all sin exerts itself secretly but effectually. So Adam trembled and hid himself, and it was a saying of old, I have seen God and shall die. When men are under any dreadful providence, thunderings, lightnings, tempests, or in darkness, they tremble not so much at what they see or hear or feel, is from their secret thoughts that God is nigh, and that he is a consuming fire. Now these inbred notions lie universally against all apprehensions of forgiveness, which must be brought into the soul from without, having no principle of nature to promote them. Thus it appears that a real solid discovery of forgiveness is indeed a great work. Many difficulties and hindrances lie in the way of its accomplishment." We proceed to expose some of the false presumptions of forgiveness, which men deceive themselves. It may be objected as to the considerations just adduced, that we find men abundantly ready to expect forgiveness from God. What's so common as, God is merciful? 
Are not the convictions of most men stifled by this soothing apprehension? Is it not a common complaint that men presume on it to their eternal ruin? I answer, the folly of poor souls and their presuming on forgiveness can never be enough lamented. It is one thing to embrace a cloud, a shadow, and another to have the truth in reality. I shall hereafter show the true nature of forgiveness and wherein it consists, whereby the vanity of the self-deceiving will be exposed. It will appear in the issue that notwithstanding all their pretensions, the most of men know nothing at all, or not anything to the purpose of true forgiveness. I therefore proceed to show in some few observations how far this delusion of many differs from a true gospel discovery of forgiveness. An atheistical presumption that God is not so just and holy, or not just and holy in such a manner as he is represented, is the ground on which multitudes persuade themselves of forgiveness. Men think that some declarations of God are fitted only to make them mad, that he takes little notice of their sins, and those he does notice he easily will pass by as they suppose better becomes him. Come, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Their inward thought is, the Lord will not do good, neither will he do evil, which, says the psalmist, is men thinking that God is such an one as themselves. Psalm fifty twenty one. They have no deep, no serious thoughts of his greatness, holiness, purity, severity, but think he is like themselves, so as far not to be much moved with what they do. What thoughts they have of sin, the same they think God has. If with them a slight ejaculation be enough to expiate sin so that their consciences are no more troubled, they think the same is enough with God, so that it will not be punished. The generality of men make light of sin, and he that has slight thoughts of sin had never great thoughts of God. Indeed, men's undervaluing of sin arises from their contempt of God. The evil of sin flows from its relation to God, and as men's apprehensions are of God, so they will be of sin. This is the state of most men. They know little of God and are little troubled about anything that relates to Him. God is not referenced. Sin is but a trifle. Forgiveness a matter of not. Whoso will may have it for asking. But shall this atheistical wickedness of the heart of man be accounted a discovery of forgiveness? Is not this to make God an idol? He who is not acquainted with God's holiness and purity, who knows not sin's desert and sinfulness, knows nothing of forgiveness. From the doctrines of the gospel commonly preached, there is also a vague notion in the minds of men that God is ready to forgive, a mere speculative apprehension of this truth, without any real satisfactory foundation of that apprehension as to themselves. This they have heard, this they have been often told, and a general persuasion spreads itself over all to whom the sound of the gospel comes. It is not a real reception of the gospel, but it is an opinion growing out of the reports of it. Hence I shall briefly show the differences between this common prevailing apprehension of forgiveness and faith's discovery of it to the soul in its power. Number one, the prevailing apprehension is loose and vague. A truth receives speculatively and not in its power. It wants fixedness and foundation, which defects accompany all notions of the mind that are only retained in the memory, not implanted in the judgment. They hear that God is merciful, and as such they intend to deal with him. For the true foundation on which the pure and holy God will do no iniquity, the righteous God, whose judgment it is, that they who commit sin are worthy of death, should yet pardon iniquity. They don't weigh, they don't consider. They take it for granted that so it is, and never seriously inquire how it comes to be so, and that because they have no real concern about it. How many thousands may we meet who take it for granted that forgiveness is to be had with God, and yet never had any serious exercise in their souls about the grounds of it, and its consistency with His holiness and justice? But those who know it by faith have a sense of it fixed particularly and distinctly on their minds. They have ascertained the grounds of it in Christ, so that on a good and unquestionable foundation they can go to God and say, There is forgiveness with thee. They see how more glory comes to God by forgiveness than by punishing sin, which is a matter that the other sort of men are not at all solicitous about. 
If they may escape punishment, whether God have any glory or not, for the most part they are indifferent. Number two, those who indulge this false apprehension have not been brought by the power of their convictions and distress of conscience to make the earnest inquiry whether this be so. Their confidence is not the result of a deep inquiry after peace and rest. It is antecedent to trial and experience, and so is not faith but opinion. For although faith be not experience, it is inseparable from it. Distress in the conscience has been prevented by this opinion, not removed. The reason why most men are not troubled about their sins to any purpose is a persuasion that God is merciful and will pardon, when indeed none can really, on gospel grounds, have that persuasion but those who have been deeply troubled for sin. Those who make this discovery by faith have had conflicts in their own spirits, and being deprived of peace have made diligent search whether forgiveness were to be obtained." The persuasion they have of it, be it more or less, is the issue of a trial they have had in their own souls, of an inquiry how things stood between God and them, as to their acceptance with Him. This is a vast difference. One class might possibly have had trouble in their consciences about sin, had it not been for their opinion of forgiveness. This has prevented or stifled their convictions, not healed their wounds, which is a work of the gospel. But it has kept them from being wounded and lulled them into security. Yea, here lies the ruin of most who perish under the preaching of the gospel. They have received a general notion of pardon, it floats in their minds, and promptly presents itself to their relief on all occasions. Does God at any time in a dispensation of the word under an affliction or the outbreaking of some heinous sin begin to deal with their conscience? Before their conviction can ripen, they choke it and heal their conscience with this notion of pardon. Many a man between the house of God and his dwelling is thus cured. You may see them go away shaking their heads and striking on their breasts, and before they come home, be as whole as ever. Well, God is merciful. There is pardon. has wrought the cure. But the other class have obtained their persuasion as a result of the discovery of Christ in the gospel upon a full conviction. Number three. These delusive hopes of forgiveness work no love to God, no delight in Him, no reverence of Him. None deal worse with God than those who have an ungrounded persuasion of forgiveness. And if they seem to fear Him, or love Him, or obey Him in anything, it is from other motives and considerations which will not render anything they do acceptable. Carnal boldness, formality, and despising of God are the common issues of such a persuasion. Indeed, this is a generation of great sinners in the world, men who have a general apprehension but not a sense of the special power of pardon. Where faith makes a discovery of forgiveness, all things are otherwise. Great love, fear, and reverence of God are its attendants. Mary Magdalene loved much, because much was forgiven. Great love will spring out of a great forgiveness. There is forgiveness with thee, saith the psalmist, that thou mayest be feared. No unbeliever truly and experimentally knows the truth of this inference. Number four, this delusive apprehension of the pardon of sin begets no serious thorough hatred and detestation of sin, but rather secretly insinuates into the soul encouragement to continue in it. It tends to lessen and extenuate sin and to support the soul against its convictions. So Jude tells us that some turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. But how can they do this? Well, what was once grace ever become wantonness? It is their perversion of the doctrine of grace, not of real grace, that is intended. The doctrine of forgiveness may be thus abused. From hence to men who have only a general notion of it habitually draw secret encouragements to sin and folly. Paul informs us that carnal men are very apt to make such conclusions, Romans 6, 1. And it will appear at the last day how unspeakably this glorious grace has been perverted in the world. It would be well for many if they had never heard the name of forgiveness. It is otherwise where this revelation is received indeed in the soul by believing, Romans 6, 14. Our being under grace... Under the power of the belief of forgiveness is our great preservative from being under the power of sin. Faith of forgiveness is the principle of gospel obedience, Titus 2, 11 and 12. 
Number five, this vague notion of forgiveness brings with it no sweetness, no rest to the soul. Flashes of joy it may be abiding, rest it doth not. The truth of the doctrine fluctuates to and fro in the minds of those that have it, but their wills and affections have no solid delight nor rest by it. Hence, notwithstanding all the professions made in the world of forgiveness, most men ultimately seek for peace and comfort from themselves. Everyone in his several ways pleases them himself with what he does in answer to his own conviction, and is disquieted as to his state according as he seems to himself to come short of the mark he had fixed. One duty yields him more repose than many thoughts of forgiveness, but faith finds sweetness and rest and forgiveness with God. It is the only harbor of the soul. It leads a man to God, to Christ as his rest. Fading, vanishing joys do oft times attend the one, but solid delight and constant obedience are the fruits of the other only. Number six, those who have the former only take up their persuasion on false grounds and cannot but use it to false ends and purposes. Self-righteousness is their dependence, and when that is too short or too narrow to cover them, they piece it out by forgiveness. Where conscience accuses, this must supply the defect. Faith, on the contrary, lays it on its proper foundation and uses it to its proper end as the sole and only ground of our acceptance with God. That is the proper use of forgiveness that all may be of grace. For when the foundation is pardoned, the whole superstructure must be grace. Thus it is evident that notwithstanding the pretenses to the contrary, insinuated in the objection now removed, it is a great thing to have gospel forgiveness discovered to a soul in a saving manner. The Nature of Forgiveness, Chapter 5 I now proceed to inquire into the nature of that pardon which poor, convinced, troubled souls seek after, and which the Scriptures propose to them for their relief and rest. And as before, I shall not treat the subject absolutely or abstractly, but in its practical relation to the truth we have been considering, that it is a great thing to attain to a true gospel discovery of forgiveness. Number one, as already shown, forgiveness has relation to the gracious heart of the Father, including both the infinite goodness and graciousness of His nature, and the sovereign purpose of His will and grace. The infinite goodness of His nature is here exhibited. Sin stands in contrariety to God. It is rebellion against His sovereignty, opposition to His holiness, a provocation to His justice, a rejection of His yoke, a casting off of the creature's dependence on its Creator. That God, then, should have pity and compassion on sinners, and every one of whose sins are as inconceivably more evil than we can comprehend, argues an infinitely gracious nature in him. That this is a head or spring from which forgiveness flows is manifest from the solemn proclamation which he made of old of his name, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Having made this known to be his name, and thereby declared his nature, he in many places proposes it as a relief, a refuge for sinners, an encouragement to come to him and to wait for mercy from him. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. Psalm 9, 10. Others have no foundation of their confidence. But if this name of God be indeed made known to us by the Holy Ghost, why should we not repair to him and rest upon him? So Isaiah 1.10 Who is among you that feareth the Lord, that obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Not only sinners, but sinners in great distress who walk in darkness are here spoken to and called to trust in the name of the Lord. I have shown that nothing but forgiveness is of use to one in distress on account of sin. Yet is such an one here sent to the name of the Lord wherein his gracious heart and nature is revealed. That, then, is a very fountain and spring of forgiveness, and what John would impress a sense of upon our souls, where he tells us that God is love. Infinite goodness and grace is the soul wherein forgiveness grows. It is impossible that this flower should spring from any other root unless this be revealed to the soul. Forgiveness is not revealed. Field. To consider pardon merely as it is terminated on ourselves, not as it flows from God, will bring neither profit to us nor glory to God. This discovery of forgiveness in God is, as we have said, no common thing. It is a great discovery. 
Let men come with a sense of the guilt of sin to have deep and serious thoughts of God, and they will find it no easy manner truly and thoroughly to apprehend this loving and gracious nature of God in reference to pardon. Though men profess that God is gracious, yet their aversion to Him and communion with Him abundantly manifest that they do not believe what they say. If they did, they could not but delight and trust in Him. For they that know His name will put their trust in Him. So the slothful servant in the gospel said, I knew that thou wast austere, and not for me to deal with. It may be he professed otherwise before, but that lay in his heart when it came to the trial. But this, I say, is necessary to those to whom this discovery is to be made, even a spiritual apprehension of the gracious, loving heart and nature of God. This is the spring of all that follows, and the fountain must be infinitely sweet from which such streams do flow. He that considers the glorious fabric of heaven and earth, with the things contained in them, must conclude that they were the product of infinite wisdom and power. And he that really considers forgiveness and looks on it with a spiritual eye must conclude that it comes from infinite goodness and grace. Thou, Lord, art good and ready to forgive. Psalm 86, 5. Thou art a God ready to pardon, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness. Nehemiah 9.17 Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity because he delighteth in mercy? Micah 7.18 When a sinner is in good earnest seeking after forgiveness, there is nothing he is more solicitous about than a heart of God towards him. Nothing that he more labors to discover. There is nothing that sin and Satan labor more to hide from him. This he rolls in his mind and exercises his thoughts about. And if ever that voice of God, fury is not in me sound in his heart, he is relieved from his great distresses. This fear of our hearts, our Savior seems to intend to prevent or remove. John 16, 26 and 27. I say not that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. The disciples had good thoughts of the tender heart and care of Christ himself, the mediator towards them. But what is the heart of the Father? What acceptance shall they find with him? Will Christ pray that they may find favor with him? Why, he says, as to the love of his heart, there is no need of it, for the Father himself loveth you. If this then belong to forgiveness, as whoever has sought for it well knows, it is certainly no common discovery to have it revealed to us. To have all the clouds and darkness raised by sin between us and the throne of God dispelled, to have the fire and storms and tempests that are kindled and stirred up about him by the law removed, to have his glorious face unveiled and his holy heart laid open, and a view of those infinite treasures and stores of goodness, mercy, love, and kindness, which have had an unchangeable habitation therein from all eternity, to have a discovery of these eternal springs of forbearance and forgiveness is what none but Christ can accomplish. John 17:6. But this is not all. This eternal ocean of divine love that is infinitely satisfied with its own fullness and perfection does not naturally yield four strings for our refreshment. Mercy and pardon do not come forth from God as light from the sun or water from the sea by a necessary consequence of their nature as whether they will or not. It does not necessarily follow that any one must be made partaker of forgiveness because God is infinitely gracious. For may he not do what he will with his own, who has given first unto him that it should be recompensed unto him again. Romans 11.35 All the fruits of God's goodness and grace are in the soul keeping of his own sovereign will and pleasure. This is his great glory, Exodus 33.18 and 19. Show me thy glory, says Moses. And he said, I will make all my goodness to pass before thee, and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. Upon that proclamation of the name of God, that he is merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness, some might conclude that it could not but be well with all. Nay, he says, but this is my great glory, that I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. There must be an interposition of a free act of the will of God to deal with us according to this, his abundant goodness, or we can have no interest therein. This I call the purpose of his grace, or the good pleasure that he has purposed in himself, Ephesians 1, nine, or as it is termed, verse 5 and 6, the good pleasure of his will that he has purposed to the praise of his glorious grace. 
This free and gracious pleasure of God, or purpose of his will to act according to his own abundant goodness, is another thing that influences the forgiveness of which we treat. Pardon flows immediately from a sovereign act of free grace. This free purpose of God's will and grace for the pardoning of sinners is indeed that which is principally intended when we say there is forgiveness with him. That is, he is pleased to forgive, and so to do is agreeable to his nature. Now the mystery of this grace is deep. It is eternal and therefore incomprehensible. Few there are whose hearts are raised to a contemplation of it. Men rest and contest themselves in a general notion of mercy which will not be advantageous to their souls. Freed they would be from punishment, but what it is to be forgiven they inquire not. But these fountains of God's actings are revealed that they may be the fountains of our comforts. Number two. Now, of this purpose of God's grace, there are several acts, all of them relating to gospel forgiveness. First, there is his purpose of sending his son to be the great means of procuring, of purchasing forgiveness. Though God be infinitely gracious, though he purpose to exert this grace and goodness towards sinners, yet he will do it in such a way as shall not be prejudicial to his own holiness and righteousness. His justice must be satisfied, and his holy indignation against sin made known. Wherefore he sent his Son to make way for the exercise of mercy, so as no way to eclipse the glory of his justice, holiness, and hatred of sin. Better we should all eternally come short of forgiveness than that God should lose anything of his glory. This we have in Romans 3.25. God set him forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. The remission of sins is a thing aimed at, but this must be brought about, that not only the mercy but the righteousness of God may be declared, and therefore it must be brought forth by a propitiation or atonement in the blood of Christ. So John 3.16, 1 John 4.9, Romans 5.8. Moving forward in Owen's treatise to chapter 6, Support from Forgiveness. The discovery of forgiveness in God is a great support for a sin-entangled soul, although it has no special persuasion of its own particular interest therein. Somewhat is supposed in this assertion and somewhat affirmed. Number one, it is supposed that one may have a gracious persuasion and assurance of faith concerning his own particular interest in forgiveness. Men may, many do, believe it for themselves so as not only to have the benefit of it, but to comfort also. Generally, all the saints mentioned in Scripture had this assurance, unless in the case of depths and desertions, as described in this psalm. David expresses his confidence of the love and favor of God to his own soul hundreds of times. Paul does the same for himself. Christ loved me and gave himself for me, Galatians 2.20. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which God, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, Second Timothy 4, eight, And that this boasting in the Lord and his grace was not peculiar to himself, he shows in Romans 8.38 and 39. Nothing can be more vain than what is usually pled to remove this sheet anchor of the saint's consolation, namely that no man's particular name is in the promise, that it is not said to this or that man by name that his sins are forgiven. To think it necessary that the names whereby we are known among ourselves should be written in the promise, in order that we may believe in particular every one for himself, is a vain conceit. True, the new name of every child of God is in the promise, and believing makes it very legible to him. Yea, we find by experience that there is no need of argumentation in this case. The soul, by a direct act of faith, believes its own forgiveness. But I will not dwell here and proceed to remark that, number one, it is the duty of every believer to seek assurance of personal forgiveness. The apostle exhorts us all to it. Let us draw near in full assurance of faith, Hebrews 10.22, that is, of our acceptance with God through forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. And this principle of our faith and confidence he would have us hold fast unto the end, chapter 3.14. It is no small evil in believers not to be pressing after perfection in believing and obedience, and some sinful indulgence to self or the world or sloth is often the cause of it. Hence few come up to gospel assurance. But yet most of our privileges and our comfort depend on this. To encourage to this duty, consider whence this assurance is produced and what fruit it bears. 
It is, in general, the product of special communications of the Spirit. It flourishes not without His sealing, witnessing, establishing, and shedding abroad the love of God in our hearts. See Romans 5, 2 and 5. And what believer ought not to long for and press after the enjoyment of these things? Nay, to read of these things in the gospel, not experiencing them in our own hearts, and yet to sit down quietly without continual pressing after them, is to despise the blood of Christ, the spirit of grace, and the whole work of God's love. If there are no such things, the gospel is not true. If there are, and we press not after them, we are despisers of the gospel. Surely he has not the spirit who would not have more of him, all of him that is promised by Christ. These things are the hundredfold that Christ has left us in the world to counterpoise our sorrows and losses. And shall we be so foolish as to neglect our only abiding riches and treasures? In particular, it is a product of a vigorous act of faith, and that our faith should be such always in every condition. I suppose our duty to endeavor. Not only our comfort, but our obedience also depends upon it. The more true faith, the more obedience. For all our obedience is the obedience of faith. The fruits of this assurance are the choice actings of our souls towards God as love, delight, rejoicing in the Lord, peace, joy, and readiness to do or suffer. In the ordinary dispensations of God towards us, it is also usually by our own negligence that we come short of this assurance. True, it depends in a peculiar manner on the sovereignty of God. He is as absolute in giving peace to believers as in giving grace to sinners. He creates light and causes darkness as he pleases. But yet, considering what promises are made to us, what encouragements are given us, what love and tenderness there is in God to receive us, I cannot but conclude that ordinarily our own neglect is the cause of our coming short of this assurance. Number two, it is further supposed in our proposition that there is or may be a saving persuasion or discovery of forgiveness in God, where there is no assurance that our sins in particular are pardoned. Who is among you that feareth the Lord and obeyeth the voice of his servant, that walketh in darkness and hath no light? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and stay upon his God. Isaiah 50 verse 10. Here is the fear of the Lord and obedience with a blessed encouragement to rest in God, yet no assurance nor light but darkness, and that walked in or continued in for a long season. For he cannot walk in darkness without any ray of light, as the words signify, who is persuaded of the love of God and the pardon of his sins. And yet the faith of such an one and his obedience springing from it have this gracious promise of acceptance with God, and innumerable testimonies to this purpose might be produced. I shall only confirm it in one observation concerning the nature of faith, and one more about the proposal of the thing to be believed or forgiveness. Faith is called a cleaving unto the Lord, Deuteronomy 4.4. 4. It is also expressed by trusting in the Lord, rolling our burden or casting our care upon Him, by committing ourselves or our ways to Him. Now all this goes no further than the soul's resignation of itself to God, to be dealt with by Him according to the tenor of the covenant of grace, ratified in the blood of Christ. This a soul cannot do without a discovery of forgiveness in God. But this a soul may do without a special assurance of his own interest therein. This faith will lead men to conclude that it is their duty and their wisdom to give up the disposal of their souls to God and to cleave to him as revealed in Christ, waiting the pleasure of his will, to enable them to make Christ their choice and will carry men to heaven safely, though it may be at some seasons not very comfortably. The revelation of forgiveness made in the gospel evidences the same truth. The first proposal of it, or concerning it, is not to any man that his sins are forgiven. No, but it is only that there is redemption and forgiveness of sins in Christ. So the Apostle, Acts 13, 38 and 39, Be it known to you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which they could not be justified by the law of Moses. All this may be believed without a man's assurance of his own personal interest in the things mentioned. 
Now, where they are believed with the faith the gospel requires, that faith is saving and the root of gospel acceptable obedience, the ransom, the atonement by Christ, the fullness of the redemption in him, and so forgiveness in his blood for believers, from the good will, grace, and love of the Father, is the first gospel discovery in which a sinner in a saving manner rests. Particular assurance arises or may arise afterwards, and this also is supposed in the assertion. The point affirmed is that a discovery of forgiveness in God without any particular assurance of personal interest therein is a great support to a sin-entangled soul. And let no man despise the day of this small thing, small in the eyes of some, and those good men also, as if it did not deserve the name of faith. This discovery of forgiveness is the soul's persuasion on gospel grounds, that however it be with him, and whatever be his condition, God in his own nature is infinitely gracious, and that he has determined in a sovereign act of his will from eternity to be gracious to sinners, and that he has made way for the administration of forgiveness by the blood of his Son, according as he has abundantly declared in the promises of the gospel. However it be with me, yet thus it is with God, there is forgiveness with him. This is the first thing that a soul in its depth arises to, and it is a support for it, enabling it to perform all present duties until consolation come from above. We may observe how far this relief extends into what it enables the soul as first. The soul is enabled thereby to resign itself to the disposal of sovereign grace in self-abhorrence and a renunciation of all the other ways of relief. He putteth his mouth in the dust, if so be there may be hope. Lamentation 3.29 What God will is his language. Here he lies at his disposal, humble, broken, but abiding his pleasure. Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Job 13.15 However he deals with me, whatever be the event, I will abide, cleaving to him. I will not think of any other way of extricating myself from my distress. I will neither fly like Jonah, nor hide like Adam, nor take any other course for deliverance. Saith the soul, God is a God that hideth himself from me. Isaiah 45.15 I walk in darkness and have no light. Chapter 1.10 My flesh faileth and my heart faileth. Psalm 73:26. So that I am overwhelmed with trouble. Mine iniquities have taken such hold on me that I cannot look up. Psalm 40, verse 12. The Lord has forsaken me, and my God hath forgotten me. Isaiah 49:14. Every day am I in dread and terror, and am ready to faint, and no relief can I obtain. What then shall I do? Shall I curse God and die? Shall I take the course of the world, and judging it will be no better, be holy regardless of my latter? in. No, I know whatever my lot and portion be, that there is forgiveness with God. This and that poor man trusted in him. They cried unto him and were delivered. David in his great distress encouraged his heart in the Lord his God. Second Samuel fifteen twenty five and 26. It is good for me to cast myself into his arms. It may be he will frown. It may be he is wroth still. But to him I will go. As it seems good to him to deal with me, so let it be. And unspeakable are the advantages which a soul obtains by the self-resignation which the faith treated of will infallibly produce. Number two. It extends itself to a resolution of waiting on God. This the church comes to. It is good that a man should both hope and quietly wait for the salvation of the Lord. Lamentation 3.26 I will not give over my expectation. I will not make haste nor limit God, but I will lie at his feet until his appointed time of mercy shall come. Expectation and quietness make up waiting. These the soul attains to with this support. It looks upwards as a servant that looks to the hands of his master, still fixed on God, to see what he will do, to hear what he will speak concerning him, missing no season, no opportunity, wherein any discovery of the will of God may be made to him. And this he does in quietness, without repining or murmuring, turning all his complaints against himself and his own vileness, that has cut him short from a participation of the fullness of love and grace in God, that this effect also attends this faith will fully appear in the close of the psalm. 
Number three, it supports our awaiting and the use of all means for the attainment of a sense of forgiveness, and so hath its effects in the whole course of our obedience. There is forgiveness with thee that thou mayest be feared. To fear the Lord is an expression comprehensive of his whole worship and all our duty. To this I am encouraged, says the psalmist, in my depths, because there is forgiveness with thee. I will abide in all duties and all the ways of thy worship wherein thou mayest be found. And however it be for a while, the latter end of the soul who thus abideth with God will be peace. Let us then see by what means the discovery of forgiveness yields this support. Number one, it begets confidence in God, and consequently some love to Him. The soul apprehends God as one infinitely to be desired and delighted in. It cannot but consider Him as good and gracious, however doubtful as to its own state. God is good to Israel, to such as are of a clean heart. As for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. Psalm 73, 1 and 2. However my state is, yet I know that God is good, good to Israel, and therewith will I support myself. When once the soul has reached this ground, that it considers God in Christ as one to be delighted in and loved, great and blessed effects will ensue. First, self-abhorrence and condemnation with resignation of all to God and permanency therein certainly attend it. Secondly, still something in God will be brought to mind to relieve it under fainting. Some new springs of hope will be every day opened. Number three, and the soul will be insensibly wrought upon to delight itself in God. Though in his own particular case he meets with frownings, chidings, and repulses, yet this still relieves him that God is as has been declared, so that he says, However it be, yet God is good, and it is good for me to wait upon him. Without this discovery the soul is not drawn to God, and whatever it does with respect to him it is because it dares do no otherwise, being overawed with his terror and greatness. Such obedience God may have from devils. Number two, it removes a number of overwhelming difficulties that lie in the soul's way before it closes with this discovery of forgiveness. It takes away all the hindrances that have been mentioned from the greatness, holiness, and severity of God, the strictness of the law, and the natural actings of conscience rising up against all hopes of forgiveness. All these are by this faith removed. Where this faith is, it discovers the true nature of gospel forgiveness. It reveals it as flowing from the gracious heart of the Father through the blood of the Son. This propitiation in the blood of the Son removes all these difficulties, even antecedently to our special sense of an interest therein. It shows how God may be exalted and the law fulfilled, and yet forgiveness be extended to sinners. All those dreadful apprehensions of God which were wont to arise in the first thoughts of coming to Him are now removed. In particular, it removes the overwhelming consideration of the unspeakable greatness of sin as exceeding the mercy of God. This presses the soul to death when it is possessed with it. Were not their sins so great, such as no heart can imagine or tongue declare, it might possibly be well with them, say distressed sinners. They are not so troubled that they are sinners as that they are great sinners, not so much that they are guilty of these and those sins as that they are great sins attended with fearful aggravations. Now, although this discovery frees not men from the entanglement of their sins as theirs, yet it does from the whole entanglement of their sins as great and many. That great sins can be pardoned, this discovery makes certain. Whether his own sins shall be pardoned is now the only inquiry. Whatever any faith can do, this faith will do, unless it be the making of particular application of the things believed unto itself. The soul, then, can no longer justly be troubled about the greatness of sin. The infiniteness of forgiveness that he sees in God will relieve him against it. Number three, it gives some life and encouragement in duty, and that first in duty as duty. Eyeing God by faith in such a fullness of grace, the soul cannot but be encouraged to meet him in every way of duty. Every way leading to him as leading to him must be well liked and approved. And secondly, in all duties, and herein lies no small advantage. God is often found in duties, but he is not revealed in what he will be found by any one soul in particular. This faith encourages the soul to all.
Now what support may be hence obtained is easily apprehended. Support not from them or by them, but in them as a means of intercourse between God and the soul. From these effects of this discovery of forgiveness in God, three things will ensue which are sufficient to maintain the spiritual life of the soul. Number one, a resolution to abide with God and to commit all to Him. This uh, word, as was observed, teaches us, There is forgiveness with thee, and therefore thou shalt be feared. Because this I found that I am persuaded of, therefore will I abide with him in the way of his fear and worship. To this our Savior calls John 15.4, Abide in me, except you do so you can bear no fruit. Many discouragements may rise up in the soul. Fears especially will assault it, that it shall not hold out, that it shall be rejected at last, that all is not and hypocritical with it, that it shall not be forgiven, that God indeed regards it not, and therefore it may well enough give over its hopes, which seems often as the giving up of the ghost. Again oppositions arise from corruptions and temptations to sin, contrary to the life of faith, and these often proceed to a high degree of prevalency, so that the guilt contracted may seem to cast a soul quite out of all expectations of mercy. I shall one day perish by these means, saith the soul, if I am not already lost. But where faith has made this discovery of forgiveness, the soul will abide with God against all these discouragements and oppositions. It will not leave him. It will not give over waiting for him. So David says in Psalm 73, 2, But as for me, my feet were almost gone, my steps had well nigh slipped. And verse 13, Verily I have cleansed my heart in vain. But yet after all his conflicts, he comes to this at last, verse 26, Though my flesh and my heart faileth, Yet, verse 28, it is good for me to draw near unto God. I will yet abide with God. I will not let go his fear nor my profession. Although I walk weakly, lamely, unevenly, yet I will still follow after him. So when many upon a strong temptation went back from Christ and walked no more with them, and Jesus said to his disciples, Will ye also go away? Peter replied in the name of the rest, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. John six sixty six to sixty eight. It is thus and thus with me, saith the soul. I am tossed and afflicted and not comforted. Little life, little strength, real guilt, many sins and much distress. What then, saith God, by his word, wilt thou go away also? No, saith the soul, there is forgiveness with thee. Thou hast the words of eternal life, and therefore I will abide with thee. This abiding with God also argues a rejection of any other choice. Whilst the soul is in this condition, having not attained evidences of its own special interest in forgiveness, many temptations will assail it. Both self-righteousness and sin will be very importunate in this matter. The former tenders itself as exceedingly useful to give the soul some assistance and support in its condition. Sometimes it presents itself in the aspect of a duty, but its end is to get somewhat of the faith and trust of the soul to be fixed upon it. But when the soul has indeed a discovery of forgiveness, it will give no ear to these solicitations. No, saith the soul, I see such a beauty, such an excellency, such a desirableness and suitableness to my wants and condition, and the forgiveness which is with God, that I am resolved to abide in the gospel desire and expectation of it all the days of my life. Here my choice is fixed, and I will not alter." And this resolution gives glory to the grace of God. When the soul without an evidence of an interest in it, yet prefers it above that which, with many reasonings and pretenses, offers a present relief to it, hereby is God glorified and Christ exalted, and the spiritual life of the soul secured. Number two, this discovery of forgiveness in God, with the effects of it before mentioned, will produce a resolution of waiting on God for peace and consolation in his own time and way. He that believeth shall not make haste. Isaiah 28.16, not make haste. To what? Not even to the vivid enjoyment of the thing believed. Haste argues precipitation and impatience. This the soul that has this discovery is freed from. God, speaking of the accomplishment of his promises, says, I, the Lord, will hasten it, but he will do it in its time. All oppositions and impediments considered, it shall be hastened, but in its time, its due time, its appointed time. And this the soul is to wait for, and so it will. 
As when Jacob had seen the beauty of Rachel and loved her, he was contented to wait seven years for the enjoyment of her to be his wife, and thought no time too long, no toil too hard, that he might obtain her. So the soul, having discovered the beauty and excellency of forgiveness, as it is with God, as it is in his gracious heart, and his eternal purpose, in the blood of Christ, in the promise of the gospel, is resolved to wait quietly and patiently for the time wherein God will clear up to it its own personal interest therein. Even one experimental embrace of it, though at the hour of death, well deserves a waiting and obedience of the whole course of a man's life. And this is almost manifest to have been the effect produced in his heart and spirit. For upon this discovery of forgiveness in God, he resolves both to wait upon him himself and encourages others so to do. Number three, this prepares a soul for receiving consolation and deliverance out of its pressures by an evidence of a special interest in forgiveness. It makes men watch for this manifestation. It makes a soul like the merchant who hath great riches, all his wealth in a far country which he wishes to bring home. If they come, he is well provided for. If they miscarry, he is lost and undone. This makes him hearken after tidings that they are safe, though on a foreign shore. And as Solomon said, good news in this case, from a far country, is as cold water to a thirsty soul. Proverbs 25, 25, full of refreshment, though he cannot yet look upon them as his own, absolutely, because he has them not in possession, he is glad they are safe. So it is with the soul. Those riches which it values are as to its apprehensions in a far country. He is glad to hear news that they are safe, to hear forgiveness preached and the promises insisted on, though he cannot as yet look upon them as his own. The merchant rests not here, but he hearkens with much solicitude after the things that should bring home his riches, especially if they have in them his all. He considers the wind and weather, all the occasions and inconveniences and dangers of the way, and blame him not, his all is at stake. The soul in like manners hearkens after all the means whereby this forgiveness may be brought home to it, is afraid of sin and of temptation, glad to find a fresh gale of the spirit of grace, hoping that it may bring in his return from the land of promise. This prepares the heart for a spiritual sense of it when it is revealed. It also prepares the soul by bringing it to a due estimate of the grace and mercy desired. The merchant in the gospel was not prepared to enjoy the pearl himself until it was discovered to him to be of great price. Then he knew how to purchase it, procure it, and keep it. The soul having by this acting of faith upon the discovery of forgiveness come to find that the pearl hid in the field is indeed precious is both stirred up to seek after possession of it and to give it its due. Such a soul saith, how excellent, how precious is this forgiveness with God. Blessed, yea, ever blessed are they who are made partakers of it. What a life of joy, rest, and consolation do they lead. Had I but the evidence of an interest in it, and the spiritual consolation that ensues, how would I despise the world and all the temptations of Satan, and rejoice in the Lord in every condition? And this apprehension of grace also exceedingly fits the soul for receiving a blessed sense of it, that God may have glory thereby. It also gives the soul a right understanding of forgiveness, its nature, its causes, and effects. At first the soul goes no further, but to look after impunity or freedom of punishment. What shall I do to be saved? From hell is the utmost it aims at. Who shall deliver me? How shall I escape? And it would be contended to escape anyway by the law or the gospel, if it may but escape. But upon this discovery of forgiveness, a man plainly sees its nature, and that it is to be desired for its own sake. Indeed, when a soul is in trouble for sin, it knows not well what it would have. It has an uneasiness that it would be freed from, a dread of some evil condition that it would avoid. But now the soul can tell what it desires, what it aims at, as well as what it would be freed from. It would have an interest in eternal love, have the gracious kindness of the heart of God turned towards itself, and a manifestation of a special interest in the precious blood of the Son of God, whereby atonement is made for him. 
These things he comes for, in this way alone he would be saved and no other. He sees such a glory of wisdom, love and grace and forgiveness, such an exaltation of the love of Christ in all his offices, especially in his death, sacrifice and blood shedding, whereby he procured or made reconciliation for us, that he exceedingly longs after the participation of them. All these things, in their several degrees, will this discovery of forgiveness in God, without special evidence of a personal interest therein, produce. And these will assuredly maintain the spiritual life of the soul, and keep it up to such an obedience as shall be accepted of God in Christ. Darkness, sorrow, storms, they in whom it is may meet with, but their eternal condition is secured in the covenant of God. Their souls are bound in the bundle of life. From what has been said, we may draw some inferences concerning the true notion of believing. Number one, the effects ascribed to this faith of forgiveness in God make it evident that many who pretend to believe that there is forgiveness with God do indeed believe no such thing. I only ask what effects this faith has produced in them and whether they have been enabled to perform the duties before mentioned. I fear with many the fruits of their pretended faith are quite otherwise. They love sin the more for it, and God never the better. Supposing that a few barren words will issue the controversy about their sins, they come and sense to have slight thoughts of sin and of God also. This persuasion is not of him that calls us. Poor souls, your faith is the devil's greatest engine for your ruin, the highest contempt of God and Christ, and forgiveness also that you can be guilty of, a means to let you down quietly into hell. The Pharisees trusted in Moses and will condemn you. As none is saved but by faith, so you, if it were not for your faith, as you call it, might possibly be saved. If a man's gold prove counterfeit, his jewels painted glass, his silver letter dross, he will not only be found poor when he comes to be tried and want the benefit of riches, but will also have a fearful aggravation of his poverty by his disappointment and surprisal. If a man's faith which would be more precious than gold, be found corrupt. If his light be darkness, how vile is that faith? How great is that darkness? Such, it is evident, will the faith of too many be found. Number two, the object before us is the raising of a sin-entangled soul out of its depths, and this discovery of forgiveness must give him his first relief. Commonly, when souls are in distress, what they look after is consolation. What is it, then, which they intend thereby, that they may have assurance that their sins are forgiven, and so be freed from their present perplexities? What is the issue? Some of them continue complaining all their days, and never come to rest or peace. So far do they fall short of consolation and joy. And some are utterly discouraged from attempting any progress in the ways of God. What is the reason? Is it not that they would fain be finishing their building when they have not laid the foundation? They have not yet made thorough work in believing forgiveness with God, and they would immediately have assurance in themselves. Now God delights not in such a frame of spirit, for this haste of, for assurance is selfish. The great design of faith is to give glory to God, Romans 4.20. The end of God's forgiveness is the praise of his glorious grace, Ephesians 1.6. But let a soul in this frame have peace in itself. It is very little solicitous about giving glory to God. He cries like Rachel, give me children or I die. Give me peace or I perish. That God may be honored and the forgiveness he seeks be rendered glorious is cared for, but in the second place, if at all. This self Selfish earnestness that wants to be thrusting our hand in the sight of Christ is what he will pardon in many, but accepts in none. It is impatient. Men act thus because they do not like standing afar off for any season with a publican. They love not to submit their souls to lie at the foot of God, to give him the glory of his goodness, mercy, wisdom, and love, and the disposal of them and their concerns. This waiting comprises the universal subjection of the soul to God with a resolved judgment, that is meet and right that we and all we desire and aim at should be at his sovereign disposal. This gives glory to God, a duty which the impatience of these poor souls will not allow them to perform. It is weak. It is weakness in any condition that makes men restless and weary. The state of adherence is a safe condition as a state of assurance, only it has more combats and wrestlings attending it. It is not, then, fear of the event 
but weakness and weariness of the combat that makes men anxiously solicitous about an immediate deliverance. Let then the sin-entangled soul remember always this order of the gospel that we have under consideration. First, exercise faith on forgiveness in God, and when the soul is fixed therein, it will have a ground and foundation on which it may stand securely in applying it to itself. Drive this principle in the first place to a stable issue upon gospel evidences. Answer the objections that lie against it, and then you may proceed. In believing, the soul makes a conquest upon Satan's territory. Do then as they do who are entering on an enemy's country. Secure the passage. Fortify the strongholds as you go on, that you be not cut off in your progress. Be not as a ship at sea which passes on and is no more possessed of the water. It is gone through than that of which it is not yet arrived. But so it is with a soul that rests not on these foundation principles. He presses forwards, and the ground crumbles away under his feet, and so he wilders away all his days and uncertainties. Would men but establish this principle in their souls, and secure it against assaults, they might proceed, though not with so much speed as some do, yet with more safety. Some pretend at once to come into full assurance. I wish it may prove more than a mere presumption. It is to no purpose for him to strive to fly who cannot yet walk, to labor to come to assurance in himself who never well believed forgiveness in God.